broadcast live at the Armadillo's office at 230 Ash Street. Uh, live broadcasts are available only in Reading due to technology constraints, but the meeting is videotaped for distribution to the TV stations in North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. RMLB uh, Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as those not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed at the chair and that all parties, including members of the board, act in a professional and courteous manner. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. Is the role of the chair to maintain order in all public comment or ensue discussion? Uh, Dave, will you be the board secretary tonight? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, Dave Nelson is here How are you? in the cab. Yes, Dave, I am. Thank you for nice coming. Nice to be here. Thanks. Um, now, let's see. Do we have any public comment before we do anything else? Or yep. I know there were supposed to be some members of the Climate Action Committee. Um, I'm not there's nobody here. Okay. Maybe they weren't coming till 7:30, so I don't know if you want to open what it. it is. Yeah. Open it back up for sure. them if they show up. That would be fine. Okay, thank you. Okay. No other public comment. Um, okay, so a review of the RMLD's fiscal uh, 2016 capital budget. Okay, thank uh, you. Good evening. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we presented the ca both the capital and the uh, expense budgets to the Citizens Advisory Board and um, got a, uh, approval for recommendation to the board. Uh, tonight, we're going to go through the capital budget. Um, just a reminder from last year, we changed the budget into a um, six-year plan, uh, including um, FY15 budget and year-to-date, um, all the way out to FY20. Uh, FY17 to FY20 is illustrative uh, and to give you an idea of the projects that we have planned out. Um, I do want you to know because we had um, the preliminary results of the reliability study uh, that kind of lined up what, where, we, what, where Hamid and I were, that those projects and, and issues have been were already incorporated in here. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to staff to do the presentation that was similar to the cab. It seemed to have uh, gone really well, touched on the highlights. Thank you. This way, we all, yeah. I could see that better. Is it okay? Can I hear him okay? Yeah, well, the presentation tonight includes the okay. FY 2016 capital budget uh, organizational reliability study, the results of the study that was recently completed. And we're going to be talking about then uh, about the recommend some of the recommendations that the both Booth and Associates and Lidos are here to talk about. And the next item would be the distributed generation <coughs> cost benefit analysis. And then we're going to have some questions and answer. <coughs> I guess what you see on the, the slide, it's a FY 2016 capital authorization major uh, spendings, the projects. Uh, I'm going to start with the, the highlighted ones. The highlighted ones, the ones that you see in green, these are the ones that basically they was re also recommended by the study, the reliability study, Booth and Associate. Uh, sub four switch gears breaker replacement. That's for five hundred eight thousand. These are the uh, basically big ticket items. Distributed generation for two point one six four million dollars, uh, which we are going to try at station three. We have a site that it's basically within the substation. Uh, we got gas available uh, next door at the DPW building. <coughs> We're going to express the run the express the gas line to the corner of the property. We're going to set the uh, distributed the distributed generation, and then we're going to feed the, the substation, basically the bus, through a breaker, and that's going to cost approximately 2.164 million. The substation equipment upgrades. We're going to be upgrading some of the relays at the substation four, starting with substation four and substation five, which are, are also part of the recommendations that they were made by Booth and Associates. 
the LED street lights, 1.2 million. We're going to start uh, uh, this year. That's a three-year program for a total of $3.6 million. Uh, the HVAC system upgrade, that's $600,000 for this building. The RFP was out, and uh, we, we selected the vendor, and uh, hopefully the recommendation is going to be for next month. It's being evaluated right now. And we came up approximately around the same uh, number that you know we, we kind of were expecting. Mm. Uh, then <coughs> we have the GIS upgrade for 420,000. That was also part of the recommendations. We knew that before too, uh, that we need to uh, overhaul the GIS system because the data is incomplete. The RFP for that one is out and it's due to 19th of uh, May, I believe. Uh, uh, so, uh, we're expecting to, we got, we've got a good uh, turnout, turnout. Uh, like about uh, 10 or 12 vendors, they bid, bid on it basically. Uh, the next one is step down upgrades. <coughs> These are the areas that, you know, we need to convert from uh, Fort KV to 13.8, which is going to uh, decrease the losses, overall system losses, and that's going to improve the system overall increase the plant value, you can take down the old stuff, put up, put up the new 13.8 uh, kV stuff. There's some URD upgrades that we still gonna be doing, the Cook's Farm being one of them in Linfield, uh, which right now the contractor's there, they're digging and they're re upgrading all the old uh, 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 infrastructure, the underground stuff. The routine constructions, we generally, that's how much we spend, approximately $1 million every year for new work orders for both commercials and residentials. Uh, the transformers and capacitors, uh, these are the ones that you know well we uh, upgrade as part of the transformer uh, load management program, whether it's age-related or the load-related. We have a list that we uh, go we have prioritized them right <coughs> now based on the age uh, because you know we've had few transformer oil leak in the past and that is the sign of the system or transformer de deteriorations due to the age that uh, we have prioritized them and we go on by the list and change them out. Uh, also we need to add more capacitors and controls for the capacitors so they could be controlled from the SCADA Right now, those capacitors during the peak time, they're being manually being operated. Uh, with having the uh, SCADA system, we can automate them so as the load comes on, these cap banks automatically could be programmed that they come on. And what they do, they're going to improve the power factor, they're going to decrease the KVAR losses, uh, which if you want to use the beer and foam analogy that the people, most people, they like, it's like reducing the foam uh, so you, you, you don't pay for the foam, pay for the liquid, basically. So yeah, that's that program. The rolling stock, which is the trucks, the forklift, and the also the spreader that for the winter time uh, we need for one of the trucks, that's going to be 448,000. Uh, the AMI metering system, again, that's for crop 500. We got about 60 meters, the bid uh, that we cannot get the information back from the field. Uh, the RFP went out, we selected the uh, Cooper Eaton system, which this system is the most advanced AMI system, two-way radio communication. <coughs> it's a RF mesh networking. Uh, actually, we're getting most bang for our buck because the system is capable of doing two uh, uh, things. One is uh, reading the meters that right now they're in, uh, we cannot get the information out of those, there's 60 of them. The second thing is the distribution automation, which now we can bring the field for field devices, the IEDs, all the information back from the field, back to the SCADA and OMS system for analysis and for activating the FDIR fault detection, isolation, restoration, which means improving the overall reliability and uh, uh, this system is capable of handling both. So uh, right now, the, we are going through the pilot phase. Uh, we installed one getaway, uh, one gateway at uh, RMLD, and we are testing on 13 meters to make sure that you know basically the system is capable of delivering what we put out of, uh, as RFP. Uh, and so far, everything is going well. 
the MIS, uh, these are the, some of the software, the systems, the servers, which uh, my good friend Mark, you know, he's been looking after. And, you know, him and I, we <coughs> both worked on the technology roadmap. So we're not uh, having any redundant sp spendings. And, you know, it's, everything is going well coordinated be between the departments, between James, mine, Bob's, everybody. So all the technological needs we got a roadmap that what uh, we need to do in order to make sure that you know we go in the right direction and we're spending just what we need to do to meet the future challenges that this utility is facing. Uh, the IRD, Integrated Resource Department, for some data loggers and efficiency meters, about $60,000, and the others, they're like about uh, $2 million that includes the facility site plan, the Lowell Street project, West Street project, which this is the uh, DOT project. It's funded, it's already, we, we, it's our state is paying for it, and the fiber optics loop that the RMLD owns, and we need to uh, make uh, more taps and, you know, nodes for distribution automation projects, which this is a great asset for us, especially for the future automation. This is great to have because uh, fiber is the best backbone for distribution automation sy system. So we really are happy that you know we can use those assets. Uh, so the ones that are highlighted in green, basically, these are the ones that you know were part of the booth report uh, and we coordinate it so they're included. So all total together, we're talking about $10,596,000. It sounds big, but it's really most of it are either maintenance related that, you know, these are the top, some of the work that needs to be done. The old stuff, they need to come down as an expense and the new stuff they need go back up, which they're gonna increase the plant value as capital. And, uh, that's basically it. Any questions? Any explanations? Anything you want me to on this page? So the D so go ahead. Sorry. May, can I ask a quick question? Hamid, the transfer from last year though, off of the ten point five million that they've already vote they've already approved? That's approximately uh, about two, two and a half million that is two and a half, three million. Like the HVAC is, was already 1.2 million uh, LED street lights. It was already from last year. The URD 340,000 was part of the last year. So, and uh, West Street, approximately three, three and a half million bob, right? Uh, that's basically what it is. So, out of this <coughs> three and a half million approximately, it's from last year, and then seven million we're asking now new. The big ticket out of the big part of that seven million is 2.1, 2.2 million for the distributed generation. That we know this is what we gotta do, because that's what makes sense. That's a good investment. Uh, with capacity and transmission costs going up, actually tripling, starting 2017. This is the only way that you know we can uh, be con some you know, that's a good control it somewhat uh, because it's passed on to the customers and Jane can uh, elaborate more on it uh, when we get to that. Any questions? Yes. I did have a question. So on the, that piece, you're going to be presenting on that a little bit later, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. About the, the analysis. Yep. Yeah. The comparison. Yeah. Any other questions on this page? No. Okay. Yeah, the operational efficiency, basically, we implemented the new tree trimming program <coughs> as of uh, January 10th, 2015. Uh, the IVM is out, Integrated Work, or the manage, work uh, Vegetation Management, IVM, Integrated work Vegetation Management uh, document is out. We've given it to the tree wardens and the DPW directors of each community. Uh, I had the first meeting with uh, uh, North Reading uh, DPW director and tree warden, and uh, everything is in order. So uh, we, we, as we met in with the communities, with the town manager and board of selectmen, 
and every community we um, stated that you know we'd like to go to the eight foot cut uh, as soon as the IVM is out so now the IVM been delivered to them and now we are in compliance with uh, chapter 87 of uh, Massachusetts law for uh, uh, IVM uh, to have an IVM <coughs> plan we didn't have the IVM official IVM plan mm -hmm. now we do and uh, we are in compliance in the, with, with that uh, mandate uh, terminating a uh, underground construction contractors uh, contract as of uh, September 1st 2015 Fishback and more right now they're uh, augmenting our crews to do the underground work and uh, they're doing all the underground splicing terminations and making the elbows basically what we started we started training our own crews and uh, now they've been trained well enough and they're getting <coughs> even more field experience so as of September 1st, we're going to take that back and other crews they're going to do because by contract now, we're obligated to give eight hours of uh, overtime uh, on Saturdays mandatory because the contractors are doing the work they're working on our system. Mm -hmm. So that's going to go away, the mandatory overtime. Now, it's not going to say that, you know, well, we're going to cut down the overtime uh, totally because uh, we got lots of maintenance that needs to be uh, you know, we need to get, get caught up with. Uh, also, part of the overtimes on Saturdays and Sundays that are subsidized by the contractors either for uh, uh, for the fiber installation or the jobs that, you know, some uh, customers they're requiring to shut down on holidays and stuff like that. So it won't be all uh, charged to uh, RMLD, cost to RMLD, but it should, the portion that, you know, the uh, the planned overtime should go just a bit down, but we still got a lot of work that we need to do on the maintenance part that, you know, probably <coughs> you won't see much of a change, but it's something that, you know, could, uh, could uh, possibly, if we keep the contractors, could go even higher than what, what we spent. Now we use the Paul Foreman software in-house engineering. We used to farm out the engineering services for uh, the circuit designs. We got this software, it's a great investment. It was like $14,000 with an unlimited license. Now this software guarantees that, you know, we're gonna be uh, uh, within the code. We meet the code, NESC code, National Electric Safety Code, that uh, our personal day, uh, we're being tr actually we had the training uh, for past two and a half days by Booth. They uh, gave us training, gave everybody training on National Electric Safety Code requirements and rules and regulations. So this software is, is interactive. It's very, uh, a very good uh, tool to have for the design. It's got to make sure we meet all the clearances that, you know, National Electric Safety Code for public safety and employee safety sake uh, to make sure we meet, we meet their uh, standards. So now every uh, engineer uh, has access to this software, any type of design, any pole upgrades, anything uh, in the system that any change is taking place, first it's gonna be done on that to make sure everything is uh, uh, good. Uh, it's a good engineering practice and before it goes out for construction. Uh, that's another way that you're not know, saving that you know we're gonna have operational savings. <coughs> So we're not going to be doing that by engineering firms uh, uh, any longer. Uh, implementation of the substation testing and maintenance program, uh, that's in the future. As you know, we spent $150,000 uh, uh, so we can test all the substations, all the equipment. We, we did it. We got the list that uh, we need to uh, fix. Uh, almost about 70% uh, of that is fixed already the breaker that needed to be replaced, also the f eight bushings of the transformers at station uh, four, the 115 kV slash 35 kV uh, substation, uh, I mean sub uh, transformers, that the bushings, they tested bad, and they were on the verge of failure, we caught them, so before they fail, we ordered them, we replaced them, the breaker is replaced, and some minor stuff is still left to do that uh, we get into them, now, we purchased a state-of-art, uh, you know, the testing uh, device, uh, Omicron, CPC 100, that now moving forward with the training 
uh, that we provided and is still going on uh, for our tech, new tech services group. Uh, so now in the future, they're gonna be able to do those tests. With the exception of 115 kV equipment that we don't have the test equipment, testing uh, the equipment for them. Because those are special equipment and they, we need to, it's so expensive, it's not worth it. It's better to you know, have uh, uh, professional testing vendors or companies to, to do that. But anything below 115, we're gonna be doing it in the future. So that's a substantial savings as well. So we don't have to the next time around three years uh, spend another uh, $150,000 to do that. Our internal group, they're gonna be able to do that. Uh, using the Enjon software for better track of the double poles, this is the new software that uh, uh, Verizon is using as well as the Comcast and uh, us. So automatically when one party is installing port and do the transfer automatically, that goes into the other party's uh, database and it shows that, you know, well, you got work, you got work to do. You, you got to do your transfer. So we are part of that system. We get them and we get to them in a timely manner. Uh, I just got to warn you that, you know, you're going to see more double poles throughout the system because we're going through lots of those uh, system upgrades that we need to do as a maintenance. And especially part of that is as a part of the, the poll testing program that we did 30% of the polls uh, that we tested. They failed. So now we replace the ones that they were condemned to make sure it's safe. But now the ones that, you know, they were marginal or they failed, we go on uh, them in the order that, you know, we, they need to be replaced. And, Get in there. So you're going to see some double poll sort. Yes. I, I mean, yes, if I may. Um, the uh, the poll testing program, I noticed that uh, in the data, uh, Verizon owns about two-thirds of the polls. Yes. And so we, we're testing their polls as well, I'm assuming, on this? Right now, no. Actually, that's part of the recommendation that Booth made, that, you know, we're going to have to meet with them. we got to work on the joint uh, agreement as well as talking to them about uh, the testing of their polls. Um, my recommendation would be I, I would like to test them even if they're not spending the money to do that. So, uh, but we're gonna try to run it by them because that's their set area. Right. It's their obligation. By law, they should test 10% of the polls. So we're gonna entertain them, entertain the idea. And hopefully they're gonna cooperate. But the ones that you know, we, the other ones that you know we find in the field that you know they, they are kind of uh, on the verge of failure or they're not good and test them. Then uh, we give them the list. And as a matter of fact, we did like about 17 of those polls. Mm, we, test them, we tested and that was in their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And like about 10 of those failed. So we passed it on to them and they replaced them. They already done that. So they are, they are very cooperative in, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in working with us. I'm sure for the liability reasons, they would rather they embrace that. They would rather to uh, have that done. Uh, it would be, you know, it would be an Sure, wise I guess the question is whether they wise. would pay us to do it, right? Or they, or pay, they pay us to do that. Or, you know, so we're going to work, Colleen and I, we're working with the, them, trying to make them to do that and pay for it. But no, if yeah. they're not doing it fast enough, we're going to do it. Sure. There are states where Verizon has bought out of the poll business and we don't know what's happening with Massachusetts because there's um, legislature under the DPU that you know gets a little sticky with Verizon so we're going to meet with them on the poll testing poll replacement transfers and just make sure because um, I don't know how the other companies that have bought them out are doing frontier I think is one of them but it, it could be a big issue in this area and you know if we how many polls are there? We got about 13,000. 13,000. So if two thirds are Verizon, um, you know, if we if we're looking at Digger Derricks and, and men to replace polls and do transfers, um, it, you know, it's just something we want right. to keep an eye on. Right. Can you Thank do you. me a favor? Don't don't go over the reliability and organization piece of this presentation. Okay? Sure. Yeah. Just, just quickly, Mr. Chairman, I, I know it's been many, many years, but I know that on and off this committee has discussed buying all the polls from Verizon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know there have been, through several administrations, attempts 
but it, they've been unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. So well, there's, mm -hmm. there's one other issue too, and you know, Booth is here and we've gone through three days of National Electric Safety Code training, and um, you know, that's loading and guying on the pole. Well, in some instances out in the field, when a pole has gotten hit, Verizon has come in and actually chopped down their wire and didn't replace it. So that's the other thing I want to talk to them is, is some of this stuff you have up there, it's, you're just leaving it abandoned in place because it would affect, it's going to affect our loading and our guying. Mm -hmm. So, um, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. They just leave we stuff up there. Time okay. there. The next one is purchase power savings, which uh, we're proposing a distributed generation installation at substation three. Uh, we're also uh, implementing the demand side management program and also demand response slash peak shaving program, uh, which Jane is gonna talk about. And that's gonna be done when with the, the 60 meters that we upgrade or we replace so they have the capability of implementing, that's gonna add more capability to through the AMI system. So we can implement those programs and get them more and more customers on board. <coughs> Engineering and operations, uh, you know, Booth and Associate endorsed uh, basically RML, these newly developed programs. These are the programs that it was endorsed uh, by them, the maintenance programs, grid optimization plan, system automation plan, system planning design methods, NESC code enforcement method, system design tools, training program, and safety program. All the programs that you know, we uh, gave Booth and Associate uh, during the investigation, they all endorsed and you know, we are on the right track, basically. Uh, the reliability study recommendations, I'm gonna let Booth uh, you know, to go over that because basically these are the major uh, recommendations that, are, that uh, they made, and they're gonna go over the report, uh, their findings, which are more detailed, so I'm gonna pass this aside. Uh, org study deficiencies and the org study recommendations, also Lidos, Steve Rupp is here, that he's gonna elaborate more on those, and I'm gonna let them to get more into detail. You know, That was done for uh, the CAP uh, members when uh, they weren't presented, you know, they weren't uh, in. That's a DG units. Now, I guess the comparison, Jane, you are getting into that? Yep, we can talk about this. Sure. So uh, what we wanted to do, because this was a large ticket item <coughs> in the capital budget, uh, we wanted to look at three different technologies here. So we kind of uh, looked at their strengths and weaknesses. Um, one thing that we do want to mention is all these are very good technologies, and our approach has historically been uh, the portfolio approach. So I think in, in time, as prices come down, uh, it is our hope that we can incorporate all of these into the portfolio, um, which in fact we have done some of those things. Um, so we looked at natural gas um, fuel distribution generation. Um, we compared that to battery storage, uh, energy storage, and uh, a solar PV can canopy. They're really apples and oranges, but we wanted to give the board some analytical cost benefits to look at this in terms of uh, information and voting on the uh, capital budget. Um, so we, we kind of, uh, the way we, we looked at this is we took $2 million and said, what will that buy us across these three different technologies? Um, so we have $2.1 million, which is the amount that's in the capital budget. Um, for the natural gas uh, distribution generator, that would uh, obtain approximately two megawatts of um, on peak power that would be able to curtail uh, both the capacity and the transmission peak. Um, for 2.1 million uh, for battery storage, we could get about, um, about a megawatt, um, which would have a, a capacity value of about 0.8. Um, and then for a solar canopy system, 2.0 million uh, really gets you about 750 kilowatts. Um, and then if we looked at that in terms of peak demand, because we, uh, and from a capacity standpoint, we usually peak between four and five, between three and five o'clock. Um, the solar maximizes around 10 to two, so there would be some degradation in terms of the amount of, of peak value that we would be able to obtain um, from a solar system. So we looked at the cost. Uh, we we kind of took a conservative approach here because we don't want to overestimate any savings. Uh, so we just assumed uh, a debt service of about uh, three and a half percent if we were to finance this over a 10-year period of time. 
um, in, in each of these scenarios. Um, and so we included some uh, interest in, as well as the, the payback of the principal amounts. And so when you look at through, uh, through the numbers over um, an annual basis, um, the income, the expenses for the, for the three scenarios were about uh, half a million for the DG uh, natural gas, um, about 300,000 for the battery storage, and about 252 for the solar. Uh, when we looked at the potential income, we looked at capacity credits, um, transmission credits. If we were to run this for economic and L LMP or energy savings, that could uh, arrive at some additional dollars. Um, and then uh, on the solar side, uh, the SREX is really what generates, and those are solar renewable energy certificates. Um, that ma market is regulated by the state, um, and so what we have is some pricing uh, over a 10-year period on that. And so the net cash value for those three scenarios, uh, and then we assumed it over the 10-year period because that's when we were going to finance it. Um, for the distributive uh, gas unit, it was about 4.2 million, 731,000 for the uh, battery storage, and about 414,000 for the solar canopy. Um, and so we wanted to kind of um, give the commissioners uh, a relative, you know, what's the impact on the residential customers? Because as we all know. Purchase power is a pass-through. So whatever our costs are, we pass that on to our consumers. Um, if we were able to implement some of these things, we could reduce that cost that we were passing through because we, um, as a utility, our MLD does not make any revenue on uh, or earn any revenue on that amount. But we would be able to earn on the capital. And Jane, can I ask you just a sure. quick question? Because it's a little bit of an eye chart. We can't really Sorry. see it. It's okay. It, it, was this one in your packet or no? No. Oh, I apologize. No, that's okay. Uh, but in terms of the uh, net cash value, is that a discounted cash flow over 10 yes, years? Yes, uh, we assumed, um, I believe it was 4% for the, for the net present value of that. And, and was there any residual life on any, of the, any one of these? Uh, yeah, th yeah we, we just, I think we looked at the 10 year period only because that was the financing period that we assumed, sure. but there's definitely uh, residual life after that. And, and one last question, on the, on the battery, is that conventional battery or is that that would be a utility. Elon Musk. A no, battery. that would be a utility size. Um, but just as a, as another note, where the where that just came out, what in discussions with Hamid, we'd like to do a pilot with that, so we, so we get Great. some of those on the solar system, Good. so we can get a sense of the advantages yeah. disadvantage for the consumer, for the utility, uh, and then we could we could um, do some analysis with Great. that. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple other. I don't know that the Musk uh, Tesla battery is out yet. Is it? I don't know that you can. For the houses, the small compact ones right. are out. Actually, for the station side, this house is getting out of all the I guess the storage has already added some of the lithium. Okay. Based on that. So you're going to test a lithium ion grid battery? We're going to do the, the small, so we're going to start with the small package. Lith lithium ion. Lithium -ion. There's one other, there's one other, couple other players out there. One's called Aquion, which has a different type of chemistry yep. that also has pallet sized. You've heard of them. Okay, if you're testing batteries and buying single units to test, I just want to make sure you're not just, you know, that you're testing a few different kinds. Yep. Sure. Good yeah. Good. So, uh, one, one final question sure. on that. And that so each one of the technologies provides a positive net cash flow. Correct. So they're all viable. So they're all viable, and it's just a matter of, you know, how we phase those into a long-term plan. Right. But the return of the investment on the distributed generation, gas and I think the, the compelling feature of the, the gas generator is that it's a proven technology. It's not something that yeah. just was recently developed. It's been around for a long time and is, does work. So that's you know, in, in hand in that, we're doing, you know, demand response. We've got customers signed up. The advantage of over an actual generator is we have control. 
we can make appeals out there, uh, which we plan on doing, and we, we have customers signed up. Um, and again, it's trying to get a, a little bit of everything so that when that peak period comes, we show a, a, a decrease in our megawatts. Very exciting. Yeah. yeah, all this is very exciting. It's a really well done uh, all around, I'd say, you know, very forward thinking. Um, one thing I've been wondering about, you know, batter as batteries go down, so that's a blessing in a way. They get more reliable, they get cheaper, but then everybody's got them. I wonder whether in 10 years, 20 years, the economics change where all that cheap power at night isn't so cheap anymore because everybody's everybody's soaking it up um, in their cars and in their home batteries and in their grid batteries. So I don't know if anybody's projected that. So actually the whole thing gets turned on its head. Um, I mean, not, not in a couple of years, but in the medium term. So there will be a lot more electric cars coming on, I, I think, mm -hmm. including maybe at my house. So yeah. anyway, I don't know there's no answer to that, probably. Right? Nobody knows the answer. Right. This is a nickel and dime question, but is it correct? Like we have like 300 electric water heaters or 400 electric water heaters signed up with this time switch. How many is it? Uh, between 250 and 300. And then what? Somewhere there was an estimate of how many there are in the in the district. And it was in the thousand, a couple thousand. Does anybody have a? Is that right? Uh, we did the, the GBS study back. Um, I think it was in 2008. Okay. When they had projected that it was between two and four thousand. Okay, so we're hitting about 10 percent of them. So there's 90% of the electric water heaters in the district that are out there that probably if the people knew they could get, what are, we, what are they getting, 20 bucks a month or 10 bucks a month? There's, 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 there's an, an advantage to being on the hot water. What, this will what, allow us to shut it off for two hours. What, what do they get paid for that? I, I believe the credit is somewhere between, on average, a, a little over $100 a year. A year. So, I mean, that's, that's $100. And I think if people knew about it, they'd be like, sure. Uh, I'll take the hundred bucks. I don't need hot water at three o'clock or as much, um, or it'll still be hot. So I guess you know it would still be nice to hit those other ninety percent. And and what would that buy us? Let's say if we got all three thousand of them on this program, what do you think that would do? We had, we, we had estimated that the the, uh, the ones that we had uh, two years ago, when we we shut them off during the peak, uh, was about five hundred paid us. So for two fifty. So if you got another thousand wired up, you would save two megawatts right there. So, and how much does it cost to wire up a thousand water heaters? What's the cost? The data indicates that it's two dollars. And it's like a hundred dollar no, switch. Sorry, not the so, so for you know, so you're talking about you know, a hundred grand or something. If people knew about it, for 100 grand you could get two megawatts of peak shaving for something like 100 grand. So this is where it comes in where we need the outreach and, and <coughs> this is where citizens can help us. Yep. Uh, if for 100 grand we can get two megawatts where it's two million to get two megawatts with the, with the generators. Mm -hmm. So, you know. So we'll do both. The nice yeah. thing about the, the hot water is that it, it goes unnoticed. Right, and nobody will notice that. I mean, some people don't want, won't want to do it, but almost all of them would take it if you were at their door saying, I have the switch, here's your 100 bucks, do you want to do this or not? And 9 out of 10 of them are going to say, sure, right? I mean, a lot of them will. So. The good news is that, you know, with the new AMI system, you know, we're going to have to be easily able to do more and more of the power. You'll be able to do more. One last quick question on that. Do you have the ability to see who has electric water heaters by their power consumption signature? Because uh, they, they click on and they're, they're hitting so much juice at once. There's a load signature. Are you able to see that and then just come up with a list of who these houses are? Well, 
Big Brother. Well, I mean, the, the technology does exist. But but if you're watching the but if you just are watching able to watch the load over the course of an hour or two, when the thing kicks on, it's such a big jump that it's almost certainly going to be a water heater. Yes, I suppose it could be a tanning bed too. But you know, and you might make a mistake and knock on the wrong door and. It's somebody getting a suntan, but yeah. most Mar marijuana plants, or, or they're, they're <laughs> finding a grow room, you know. So I'm just wondering if there's a way now to know. Right. But I bet there's software out there that. Well, you have uh, you saying you have hourly readings mm -hmm. per house? Okay. I think it's a good idea, and from a community outreach perspective, I think we certainly ought to do it, and maybe even as a first step, the board of commissioners and the CAB ought to convert theirs. Does anybody here have an electric water heater? I do. You have a switch on it? Uh oh. <laughs> it's a new guy. See? <laughs> we just we achieved um. something tonight. We achieved something tonight. Hey, man, I'm going to get the 100 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I want the 100 dollars. The truck will roll to your house tomorrow. <laughs> we'll talk to me tomorrow. <laughs> We're going <laughs> to. Okay. No, I know what you're saying. I, I do think there's ways, though, to, to imp infer, as you said before, from the hour leadings. I, I believe there are ways to infer and that it's well worth exploring whether we can infer the existence of an electric water heater from the hourly reads. There's different vendors and software out there. And if we can, you know, and you have a list, a short list of who you think has them, then we have a job for community uh, outreach folks to just call these people. You know, if we get it narrowed down to uh, likely houses. I'm just saying, this is low hanging fruit too. I'm done. Yeah, it's energy. Yeah. Co saving some consciousness, which I think people buy. Yeah. It yeah. But it's also the potential two megawatt peak cut yeah. that we're looking for. Yeah. That's a good idea. One question on that, Dave. Uh, couldn't we just put it on the bill? Save a hundred dollars if you have electric. I mean, it's on the bill. It's already on there. It stuff's on there. Nobody reads that stuff. Nobody reads it. Okay. Unfortunately, they they've yeah, got some great it, stuff so. on. The, yeah, I know. <laughs> that, there's great stuff right on the right on the front of the bill. You know, which is great. Get a time use meter, and you know, people just rip open their bill. They pay it. They don't. Right. I think you kind of have to show up and yep. say, "I'm here to put the meter on," you know, um, or really hit yep. them over the head with it. In a nice way. Where are we? Where are we going? Oh, is we're we done? Next, next item. I think is that that was the. That was it. Oh, I haven't seen the operating, so I don't know if we're holding on. Do we have an action item on this? Yeah. On the capital budget. Okay. Um, who's going to read the motion? Move. Uh, first up, the Citizen Advisory Board has recommended this by a vote of uh, 401. Mr. Nelson was absent, as it says here. A move that the RMLD Board of Commissioners uh, approve the fiscal year 2016 capital budget dated March 25th, 2015, in the amount of $10,596 as presented. Second. 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 Gotcha. Further discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Nice, nicely done. Uh, so, are we moving on to item six? Yep. 
Yes. So this is a motion to make a suggestion uh, that would be followed by possibly the formation of a committee to study whether there's a model that makes sense for a internet telecom offering by RMLB. Um, <coughs> there are 12 uh, munis in the state that have done some type of business um, and 29 that don't. We're, we're among the 29. Um, often, I've done some research on this in other communities, and the right way to do it is incrementally. You identify a, a very specific target that, um, I'm sorry, if I do the motion and then discuss it? Um, well, no, good oh, discussion. Yeah, sure. Keep going. Okay, Keep going. so, Keep going. Um, yeah, so You're on a roll. the opportunities can be things like there's a new project going up next to your headquarters, and you can cost out what they need, get, get them into a contract, and then you have a revenue model, and then you start with something small like that. That's what Taunton did. They had an industrial park, and they were in there, and they've been making revenue off that for 15 years. Um, you can be the service provider for your own municipality. Um, you look at what the municipality is spending today, uh, leased lines, internet, telephony, and take a look at what, if you did it, what you could do it for. Could you do better service? Could you offer a better price? And um, if so, having studied it, you can then do the service. You have a guaranteed revenue back to the department and potential savings to the taxpayer. Um, most likely, if it's never been studied and it's just been done on the private market for decades, as I suspect it has, there's probably something there. But you don't know until you study it. Um, I can tell you that other municipalities have done this and have had, have had success, but you have to have a study committee in order to even start to look at this. And it has to be all four towns that would look at it and say, you know what, we're doing a project here, or you know what, we'd like service in our town hall, or you know what, we'd, we'd like to do this or that. Uh, we need backhaul to the, um, you know, the radio tower for the police. And then when they give you that, then the department can say, okay, um, how could we cost that out? What would the revenue model be? Does it make sense? And that's the way you go about it. So anyway, that's the preamble. Um, and so I would, the, the motion that's here would, would be the board saying, you know what, we, we suggested this be done. Uh, I talked to the town manager, you know, the, the charter now lets us form committees. I think the proper way to form it would be, um, you know, we'd, we'd sit down with the cab and, and say how would, what should the full motion say that would actually create the committee that would, I think, probably jointly be the, uh, the board and the cab um, you know, defining what we would like to have people come and study and who we would want to have on it and then put an ad in and they'd come and say, you know, we'd find some people who have telco experience in the community who actually know this business and then form the committee and then send them off to study. I gave you a little draft of what a possible tasks could be for such a committee to start investigating this. Um, and, and the first task could be, you know, just identify what you have already for assets. Well, you got your electric department with a fiber loop. That's us. 23 miles already up. You got the town of Reading. It already has a fiber loop. I don't know. Does Linfield have a fiber loop um, for its own police or? No. So, yeah, I mean, often people don't know what they have. And North Reading, Wilmington, um, what do you already have? Um, so you look at it as a holistic uh, fiber network. And then the second thing you do is you'd say, well, what are we spending now in the town hall, in the schools? internally at RMLD. I know we spend a lot on, on various telco services now. Well, could we do it ourselves? I know in, in Holyoke, for example, they're saving, to a first approximation, 200000 a year by the Holyoke equivalent of us doing it for Holyoke and, and for Holyoke's own electric department's offices, two hundred grand a year. Ten years is $2 million bucks. Um, and if that's, all you, if that's all you found and that's all you did, I would say that would be worth it. Uh, and then the next thing you would do is you would ask the economic development uh, community, what do you need? You know, do, you have, do you have what you need? Are you happy with it? What would you like that would be better? Um, for example, if you want super high tech businesses, maybe you want a gigabit per second service in a very specific place. And then um, maybe you're not getting that now from the private incumbents. So that's the gist of it. So this motion would say, the board says, we would like to study it, and then we would sit down with the cab, figure out what the actual structure of the motion for a proper formation of the actual committee would be, and we'd vote on that and do it. So that's the long-winded preamble. 
Um, anybody? Yeah, I, I might make a comment. I'm, in, in general, I'm in, I'm in favor of it. I think it's interesting. Uh, and I think that if there were four communities working on this at one time, it were real. Uh, we found some interesting ways to leverage this. Four communities, rather than one community, uh, could have more of an impact in terms of being able to implement something. Uh, my only question uh, is, should it be an independent committee separate from the RMLD, or uh, are there any issues in terms of, um, even though we can now mm -hmm. set up our own committees mm -hmm. in, in RMLD, uh, is there any issue with the electric utility being involved in something like this that they would all want to be arm's length from that's a from great a regulatory perspective well that's a great uh, point and it's actually why I struggled with how to word this and specifically made it be a suggestion that one be formed and it's sort of not really uh, it's not saying we want to control the committee it's more like we hey communities we should form one and that's what we just we're just putting that out there and then I think the next conversation will be with the cab, and then going back to the your um, you know your boards of selectmen and town managers, and saying you know what do you think? How would you like to do this? And then get everybody thinking about it. Um, and then you might be right, John. Maybe I'd rather if it was you know if it was reporting to the boards of selectmen, as long as it's being done, you know. Mm -hmm. And then and as long as recommendations or, or opportunities are being brought to us, fine. But I just think it's time we did it. It's been decades. No, no such committee has ever existed in our communities. Uh, municipal light plants of our size have done this um, kind of by accident. You know, like Taunton was kind of by accident. Because they just needed it? or It's like there could be a guy who worked there and had an idea. And they said, okay, let's do that. And then it kind of mushroomed out from there. And that's literally how it happened in, like, in Holyoke, uh, which I know a lot about now. And... Uh, they, they were having problems with their substation loop. They hired a guy. And he ended up coming up with some ideas of what to do to save. And it just went from there over the course of 15 years. So it's, I really think it's, it's really random why some do it and some don't. There's no reason why Reading, maybe Phil, I don't know, did it ever come up? No, never been discussed. I mean, right. Not that I remember. Right. So, but it, that's not because anybody looked at it and said we shouldn't do it. It was more like it just kind of didn't happen. It just never happened, yeah. So, so it doesn't necessarily need to be sponsored by the RMLD or by the selectmen. I mean, we could just form an independent, separate group with under the guise of all of the towns, I imagine, if we could find interested individuals who wanted to work on it uh, for some, you know, being yeah, able to so, look at things. So the how is the would, how is, would yeah. be after this. This would just be us signaling that we think this should be something. <coughs> um, and that's exactly why I, I worded it this way. Uh, it, you know, if there's somebody else who wants to own it and do it, great. Um, if not, maybe we should do it. Maybe we could trade with the town and take over the committee there, suggesting a little bit later on this committee reports to the selectmen. Or we could take the firearms committee, and they could take this one. <laughs> <laughs> there is a firearms committee is, being is formed. Yeah, I like see. You. Okay. It's, it's, you know. Okay, good. Um, so I didn't mean to take up so much time. Well, I think, though, to – I guess my view would be you want it independent, but – Based on what little I know with the reorganization in town, it probably needs, Phil probably would know better than any of us, it probably needs to ride up to some uh, organizational. Well, just, just so that it happens. Yeah. So maybe maybe it, this is appropriate with CAB's involvement, but right. I think the way you get around the kind of the arm's leg thing is I think of who, who chairs it and who's appointed to make sure there's no non CAB or RMLD members. Right, I don't think any of them should be CAB or RMLD members. I think they should be experts in the community who, economic development people and some people with telco knowledge that, you know, mm. we could use to, to look at it and say, because they are telco people, they can see the opportunity that we can't see because we don't have the telco. Dave Nelson, what do you think, uh, not that you would speak on behalf of your colleagues, but this sound like something the CAB might be interested in? Yes, I do. I think it'd be good to pursue it and just see where it goes from. Like you say, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be good just to start the conversation and see what happens. I mean, it's good stuff. Yeah. So do we need a motion to do this, or do we? Well, I, I think we should just because we should we should say speak as a board that we think it's a good idea to to suggest forming one, and that we then go to the cab, uh, we talk it over with the cab, and talk it over with the town managers and see what would the structure of this be, how would it get appointed and so forth. And then we could have, once we vet that out, 
we could have a properly worded motion that we've all kind of looked at that actually creates it and defines how many people, you know, of which, of, from how many, from each community, et cetera, et cetera. So would you like me to read the motion? Can we sure. Move, it? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, move that the RMLD Board of Commissioners suggest that a four-town broadband study committee be formed with input from RMLD Citizens Advisory Board and the four boards of selectmen to investigate potential municipal and school savings, economic development opportunities, as well as other market needs that could be served by an RMLD internet or telecom offering, I'm, I'm going to add, or other. Second. I'll second. I'll second. Can I make just one suggestion? Please. That maybe in the motion, where you in the second line there, where you say committee uh, be investigated and if appropriate, be formed? Uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Be investigated. Yeah. Yep. Be investigated so and if appropriate, yeah. be formed. Yep. Because it sounds like, you know, you're saying, let go off and form this. Yeah, committee. exactly. Yeah. That's, right, you right. Know, I don't think that's the intent. The intent is to go off and okay. explore the possibility. I think that's fine. Right. Good. So with that, with that addition, did we already second it? Yeah. yeah. Second it. With yeah. the addition? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, it's Well, he'll accept it as part of the main motion. Sure, I'll, I'll find it. You accept right. it as part of the main I motion? I accept part of the main motion to right. That's fine. make those mm -hmm. changes, right. and we'll incorporate those into the motion. Very good. Can I have a second? I, second. I second it already. Yeah. Second it, we'll accept it as part of the main all, motion. All in favor? Yeah. And we got 5 0. Oh. oh. Yeah, that's great. So hopefully we can do something with that. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come next week, Dave, and keep, it, keep the conversation going. Yeah, it's, it's on our agenda for the 20th. That's great. Yeah. I will be there. Um, sorry to add that to the busy night. <laughs> okay. Now we have to. We have a reorganization on the agenda. We've had some had an election. John, congratulations on your hard-fought victory. Hey, hey. You know, I want to know how Dave beat you by six votes. <laughs> hey, I think I have a mandate. I have a mandate. What, you, you, you turn out your family? <laughs> you turn out your family members? <laughs> uh, Thanks for noticing, Phil. <laughs> He's handsomer. I couldn't resist. Sorry. Sorry, John. <laughs> it's fine. I think, I think it's become a custom that after each election we, we revisit. And, uh, yes. I think uh, so. With that. <laughs> Uh, do we have any uh, any nominations for chair of the RMLD? Yes, I'd like to nominate uh, Tom O'Rourke for chair of the RMLD. Uh, can I second that? Or I will that? second it anyway. Fine. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do we also do a vice chair at the same time, or do we do separate votes? Well, check check the chairman first. The chairman. Okay. Yeah. So we want to make sure that we all maybe, agree with this. Maybe he moves over. Tom, <laughs> do you have any words of wisdom to offer before we vote on this? Is this a reward for? Good deeds done. Yes, <laughs> this is your bonus. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's worded uh, a little bit differently. No, I'll be very uh, honored to serve. I uh, look forward to continuing all the good work, Dave, that you and John and Phil have done. And uh, I know that uh, Mayor has done a great job here. So well, it'll be good to have an actual uh, knowledgeable person uh, sitting in the chairman's seat. <laughs> so um, with that, should we vote? Oh, yeah. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Congratulations, Tom. Tom is the new yeah. chairman of the board. Um, and then should we do a vote on vice chair? Um, I'd be happy to be vice chair. Or if, uh, it's always good to have the that sounds good. outgoing guy. Is that, way, yeah. is that the yeah. way to do it? Okay. It's a nice transition. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I'd like to nominate uh, Dave, Dave for Dave Talbot. Dave Talbot. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dave Talbot for uh, vice chair. It's not okay. used to be vice chair. I'll second that. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, I would be happy to serve in that capacity. Uh, all in favor? Okay. And that is 5 0 and 0. Okay, great. Okay, to move up. Here you go, Tom. <laughs> happens quickly. You change your happens right away. <laughs> <laughs> Time is short. Four minutes to chair. Four minutes to chair. chair. <laughs> Relaxed already. Which one is 
the hottest part about reorganization. It is. It's the move. Yeah, the move to office. It's a new office. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna keep Same you guys view, here till like 11:30 tonight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is gonna get more and more Don't fun. Don't recess now for. Are hour? you flying <laughs> home tonight too? Okay. Move into item number eight on the presentation. Schedule for the organization reliability. Yes. Oh, so. Oh, oh, oh yes. Yeah. We're right. right. Yep. <clears throat> we they, we have to do subcommittees real yep. quick. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry. Did I jump the gun on the? Yeah. yeah. No, we, yeah. no, we're good. Gene, we want to do the subcommittees, right? Yeah, yeah we should do yeah. those. Yeah. Well, we want to have Bill and the other individual that's going to be on the board. Mm -hmm. And I could stay on the audit subcommittee. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so do we need a. Need a second one. You need, you, need a second. you need somebody to volunteer for a committee? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll volunteer. But my deep accounting skills, I think I can. There you go. So is that all what we need? Uh, so we need to go through each. Yeah, but for the audit, audit committee. In this year's time, we were really lucky. Like yeah. We needed to get a um, new team of payroll because yeah. it's just like you know, we're drawing names. Yep. Uh, yeah. It's like people are looking for that. Yeah. 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 Right. The audit committee, you guys, you have one person who's actually appointed to the town audit committee, and then the two people here are appointed to the board's audit committee. In the past, I've always been appointed to the town's audit committee. Hopefully, later on, you'll see that I can give you a chance to make a report on that. Yep. Last time we did, so. Yep. Okay. Right, and I'll be appointed to the town audit committee then, too. We want to uh, vote on all of them at the, the end? At the yeah. End. Yeah. The budget can be deep. I, I think you're right. Paper, I don't yeah. think there's yeah. any. We vote on it anyway. We all go through it. Met this year? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, we've got some okay. town fields on. Let's eliminate that committee. Yeah. 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 Okay. What's the next one, Gene? The policy. Policy. I know we're going. Um, maybe we'll keep that until we've been working. We've got some longevity yeah. in terms of understanding yeah. the policy yeah. issues. Sure. Okay, if you do. Yeah, unless somebody else wants it, you know. So. Just rotate each yeah. one. Yep. Oh yeah, that's yeah, fine. We all, we all get to produce. You're, okay. You know, we're putting you in the lineup. The all right. Got it. Yeah. Do you want to put sure. me in as the first guy? That's what I was on the payroll on the accounts table. Yep. Replace Bob Sully on that. Same with Adam. Payroll too. Oh, and yeah. same on the payroll too. Because I'm usually available in the morning. Do I need to oh, restate yeah. them, or are we okay? Well, Judge, I, I, you make a motion. Sure, yeah. I'd like to make a motion to approve yeah. all the policy changes that have been recorded uh, in terms of participation <laughs> on each one of the committees the and assignments. Okay. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Right. So five zero zero. Okay, so we're ready for number eight. So I uh, <coughs> would like to welcome uh, officially uh, Steve Rupp from uh, Lighthouse and Ken McNeil from Booth and Associates for their presentation. So we uh, turn the floor over to you guys. Good evening, commissioners and staff <coughs> and guests. Thanks for, uh, for having us in. It's been a, uh, an interesting journey since we last talked to you. Uh, I think it was last uh, autumn or, or late summer when we came in and presented what our plan was. Um, Going to try to make good use of your time. Uh, remind you uh, a little bit about what our study objectives and approach were and why we undertook this, uh, um, this endeavor. Uh, go through the tasks, our findings and recommendations. If you have questions as I go, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me and we'll do the best we can to, uh, to answer them for you. Uh, talk a little bit about why first to remind you that um, our industry is undergoing uh, profound change. 
if you spend any time out and about uh, with uh, the agencies that focus on public power, American Public Power Association, Large Public Power Council, uh, and, uh, Northeast Public Power Association, and all across the country, those agencies that are, uh, um, I thought we tried, that was a reliability uh, issue or uh, <laughs> operational issue. Point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rest assured we paid the bill. <laughs> Uh, you know, the pr profound change and, and the kind of categories that I think about when I, when I talk about the profound changes are um, infrastructure. Uh, you're going to hear a lot more about aging infrastructure when Ken gets up and speaks to you about the results of their studies. But it's a, it's a, an, it's a, it's a national problem. It's all elements of infrastructure from our roads to our uh, wet infrastructure to electric infrastructure. Uh, you name it. Uh, we are a country that has grown relatively fast. Uh, and we have not been as responsible as we could have been in keeping up with that infrastructure, all of it. And, and now we, you know, we talk about paying the price um, as we look forward to the challenges that the next generation is going to face. How are they going to come up with the money? How are they going to come up with the resources to be able to upgrade our streets, our highways, our sewers, our water treatment delivery systems, and uh, in our particular case here, our electrical infrastructure. Um, it's a big deal. Uh, talent the human resources that it takes to operate these enterprises. Um, you know, the, the average age of, uh, in this organization is uh, in the high 40s. Average years in service is over 20. Um, this is not Google. This is not Apple. This is not Microsoft. It's not what the contemporary companies look like that attract the bright young minds that come out of our, our schools and, and training institutions. Um, it's tough to find people, hard to keep people, and, and it's going to get worse as we look forward in time. So we need to really think about creative solutions to dealing with um, the, the talent challenge. And we need to rethink about what, our, what is our role as an enterprise, as an organization, to manage talent. You know, how, how hard should we be working um, to recruit, to develop, and, and to retain our people? Technology, um, it's become pervasive in this industry. I like to think that technology really shouldn't be thought about anymore as the computer on your desk or the iPhone in your pocket. It's really become part of the infrastructure itself. It's in the equipment that's installed in the substations. Um, it's soon to be in the devices that are installed uh, on people's homes, uh, on, on poles that, that to, you know, they're used to operate and uh, provide control over our distribution system. Um, and if it's infrastructure, it needs to be planned like infrastructure. It needs to be operated and maintained like infrastructure. And we don't do that today. Uh, so that's a, a real change in, in the way that utilities are thinking as they look forward. Uh, distributed resources, you know, we built this infrastructure to deliver um, energy from centralized power plants through transmission and distribution systems to homes, and that's changing. Uh, now we're being asked to operate a two-way distribution grid. It wasn't designed for that. It was never intended to, to do these things. Uh, you talked a little bit about the, um, the upcoming uh, potential for home battery energy storage that really is going to change the landscape if it's successful. Um, and, and make it even more interesting to put solar on your house that charges up the batteries that at night you're going to have excess power flowing back into the distribution system. Uh, it was never designed to do that. It'll happen, but we've got a lot of things to do to make that work. Uh, we've got uh, markets that are changing dramatically. Again, uh, you know, originally we had a nice monopoly here. We, we built power plants or we, sh we shared the, uh, in the building of power plants, provided electricity to our customers, sent them a bill, they send us our payment, and the relationship goes on and on. The markets are changing dramatically. Demand response is becoming um, a commodity that's going to be treated just like generation as you participate in the market. So you talked about the ability to operate um, your residents' um, electric hot water heaters, to turn them off to shave peak demand. Markets are going to treat that just like turning on generation. There's going to be a price associated with it, and now you have to begin to build that into your portfolio. It gets very complex very fast, and it's very different from the way that we've always done business. Um, consumption is on the decline. I was at a presentation at the California Municipal Utilities Association uh, two weeks ago in Carlsbad, and uh, um, the author of the book called Smart Power, Tom Penner, I think is his name, presented a graph from Battelle Research Institute that showed for the first time in history uh, the relationship between gross national product per capita and energy, energy consumption per capita has changed in that now we are producing more per capita GNP with less energy per capita. And it's never been that way. 
and that's a real uh, result of the investments that we've made in energy efficiency and conservation and distributed generation. And the challenge for, for RMLD and other utilities is, in order to make that sustainable, to make it work, you have to have a rate structure that allows that decline in revenue without going into your fixed operating costs. If you can't recover the fixed cost to operate the utility from that revenue stream, the utility can't survive. Today, for every kilowatt hour that a customer reduces their consumption, a little bit of that, a little slice of that, is your fixed operating costs that you're not getting that revenue from. Now, you're making strides to change that, make those corrections uh, a little bit in the last rate redesign. You're going to have to pay more attention to that as distributed generation becomes more um, prevalent in your, in your service territory. Um, and, and generation retirements. Uh, the investments that we made in centralized nuclear, centralized coal, were great back when power was almost too cheap to meter from nuclear and very inexpensive from coal plants. Regulation, legislation, political agendas have changed that landscape greatly. Coal plants are dropping like flies and nuclear power plants aren't too far behind them. I don't think we're gonna see nuclear oak or coal completely go away, but it's significantly gonna be reduced, replaced by natural gas and renewable resources. And in this particular area, there's not enough natural gas capacity to serve the demand. There's not enough pipeline to deliver gas to the generating resources in the area, and as a result, prices are gonna go up dramatically. That's another real threat. When you stack all that up, that's an awful lot to think about for this utility to survive going forward. And you asked us to come in with a question in mind, what do we need to do to make the utility, um, in, in terms of its organization, its structure, uh, to survive through the, those kinds of changes? So that was our purpose. So we looked at um, uh, four main components of the operation. We did a current situation analysis. We sat down, we interviewed uh, nearly half of the staff, uh, all of the senior management, and, and talked about these challenges, talked about what's working, talked about what's not working, and kind of really got a good idea of the current state of the, uh, of the utility, and we could talk about that a little bit further. We did a benchmarking study to look at across 20 some odd metrics how RMLD compared to its peers in the region and nationally. We looked at uh, uh, a bunch of other local utilities, Peabody, I can't remember them all, Peabody, Taunton, uh, Danville, Holyoke, and I'm missing some others, and we looked at the APPA National and APPA, it's American Public Power Association, uh, national and regional statistics, just to see how you measured up, and we'll share those results with you. We also did a, an abbreviated uh, compensation uh, benchmark or compensation survey where we looked at some of the critical positions in the utility and said, how do you look compared to the market? And is there an answer in there that might help you understand what you need to do to address the retention and the recruitment issues? Um, we looked at the overall effectiveness of the organization. Um, how are the management team working together? Uh, how is, the, you know, is work getting done that you're budgeting? Uh, and, and those kinds of issues. And we did a best practices review where we looked at uh, some 25 best practices that we believe are, are important for a utility and, and provided you an assessment of how we think you're doing um, and some recommendations. As a result, we had 52 recommendations prioritized and put into a schedule uh, as the conclusion of the report that what we think um, the RMLD team needs to take a look at and decide you know, what they want to take on in order to um, uh, move forward. So the highlights of the current situation assessment, um, the utility is definitely in a straight state of transition. You've got a lot of work to do. Uh, you've got new leadership that's been here nearly two years uh, that uh, I, I think is, is highly attuned to the challenges that the industry is facing, uh, highly attuned to what this utility needs to do to be prepared, and is looking for that right um, solution to be able to successfully manage the change that, that needs to happen in order to get there. And there's some great success stories about what's been accomplished in this time period. There's a lot of work that remains to be done. Um, a cost of service study and a rate redesign was undertaken, I think, in 2013. Um, some initial changes have gone into effect. You've got some other rate changes that are coming uh, in, into the future. I think those are excellent moves uh, and what a utility should do. It's one of the really cool values of public power that you have uh, local control. You guys sit in this room and you have the ability to make those kinds of critical changes to the business. And that gets reflected in the way that the financial community looks at you in terms of investment ratings that you get when you, want to, when you need to go out and borrow money to replace aging infrastructure. You get rewarded for that local control. That's a huge value to public power. 
Uh, you don't answer to shareholders that, that live outside the service territory, your shareholders, your owners, or your neighbors uh, and folks in the community, and you reflect their values, their priorities, and, and, and their, um, their needs. They may not always agree with you, but uh, you know, they, they get you here. And, and I think that's a, something that uh, you all should be very proud of. You've made improvements in your procurement process, um, some of it by design, some of it out of necessity, and I think, uh, I think those are really important strides. Uh, improvements in financial reporting, this has to do with uh, you know, the, the, the contemporary idea of unbundling your rates so that you can look at your cost of service from the generation transmission distribution side, and then begin to manage your business against those unbundled characteristics. That means you have to change your financial reporting to be able to look at that. You want to compare a budget and actual performance based on those unbundled categories, and you're making really good inroads um, to getting that done. Uh, a lot of work has gone into career development plans. That's in recognition of the need to be able to, number one, focus on the talent that you've got here. You already know it's hard to recruit people. Not a lot of folks are interested in coming into our industry. Um, it, it's difficult to attract them, so number one priority should be keeping the people that you've got and helping them move along in their careers. That means putting together plans for training, making it clear to them what are the expectations to be able to advance, and you're making great strides in that area. Again, some work to do. Uh, a lot of terrific efforts to improve internal communications. A reflection of that, of course, is we had an all-hands meeting today where Ken and I uh, had an opportunity to get up and present the same uh, briefing to anybody who was willing to attend, and we had a pretty full house uh, that came in for lunch, and um, I, I think uh, um, nobody got up and, and left kicking and screaming. Uh, there were some tough questions that we had to respond to. I think uh, all in all, um, folks are beginning to get it, they're beginning to understand and appreciate what lies ahead, and soon we'll see who are going to really be on board with wanting to be a part of the solution and, and who are not uh, as the next steps unfold. Um, we had great questions today from your um, uh, community services, I'm going to mischaracterize her title, communications uh, person. I you know, overlooked the communications elements of our results, power engineer, you know, I took care of the important stuff. Um, but she, she, called me, she, she called me to task and we had a great dialogue and talked about how important communication is both uh, outward facing to your customers and the community that you serve, but for here, inward. Um, you know, there has been uh, a dearth of communication in some of the old command and control structures that were here. Very, very typical of this utility, uh, not this utility, this industry. Small utilities, very strong manager, very well structured silos <clears throat> and the communication was always you know from one silo through the manager down to the next silo where it needs to go. A lot of utilities grew up that way. Tough to survive what we're facing if you continue to operate that way. We see those silos coming down and, and I think that's a, um, a very important progress. Uh, Hamid and uh, Mark working hard on a technology roadmap. Um, you know, I, I, we went through that with them and, and you know, I think you're, you're very much on the right track. Again, there's opportunities to do more uh, and, and the road mapping that we're talking about here, like the strategic plan, it's not a destination, it's a journey. So it's the kind of thing that, you know, technology changes so quickly, you've got to continually look at your assumptions, look at your, your choices and decisions and confirm them, and when they don't make sense, make an adjustment and go in a direction that you can continue to support, and we see a lot of that happening here, and that's terrific. Um, finally, getting on top of the maintenance, and I won't steal Ken's thunder, that's for him to talk about, um, but definitely a lot of time has been spent and trying to figure out how to prioritize and where to focus in looking at the maintenance of the infrastructure that you've got. Um, you've had some strong signals from the infrastructure itself about what you need to pay attention to when transformers you know, begin to leak and fail. That, that's a good sign that where you need to pay attention and, and you see the need to become more proactive and less reactive in taking care of those maintenance plans. You see it in the budgets that are being presented to you uh, and so you should feel confident that your, your utility is doing the right thing, your people are focused in the right direction. That's our current situation analysis. <coughs> Some of the uh, important issues, talent management, um, the current HR processes here, uh, in, in our opinion, have not caught up with where they need to be to face the challenges that you've got coming ahead of you. This kind of an HR structure that you have now worked really well 20 years ago. Uh, it, it, it suits the utility, but it needs to, it needs to change. Um, you know, the resources are, are, people are not fighting to come to work here. It's difficult to find people, so you've got to think more creatively and put more energy into recruiting. The folks that are at here, many of them are very far along in their careers, and they're, you know, you're getting to that point where you run a risk of how do I keep 
these valuable assets motivated and excited about embracing the challenges that we've got to solve when you know, they may not be here for more than another three or four years. And that's not an easy task. And I think some of you guys are HR uh, folks, so you kind of know what you're, you know, what you're trying to deal with there. And it, you have to be really thoughtful about how you go back and look at career development and try to find uh, some way to get value out of that last two or three percent of somebody's time and investment that they're going to be able to give you in the company. Um, and and we're, you know, we've seen signs of that taking place and there's going to be some more things that we <coughs> recommend that you do. And I think that's, I think that's good. Um, uh, succession planning is, is been started. Uh, lots of work to do around succession planning here still. You're vulnerable uh, in a lot of areas where you've got key people who have been in positions for a long time uh, that if they were to leave tomorrow, you have a big gap to fill and you're not prepared for it. So that's a priority that, that, uh, that you'll look at. Uh, the current organizational structure, we say it limits the efficiency of the utility. You could use a lot of different adjectives there. Um, the current organization is the legacy that is kind of built out of necessity. Uh, it was, it, it's a reflection of <clears throat> decisions that were made to solve problems I think with the least amount of pain. People that um, couldn't work together uh, as constructively as they might otherwise, that problem was solved by putting them in different parts of the organization that solved that interpersonal problem, but maybe it wasn't the best thing for the utility to do in the long run. So we got to kind of take another look at the organization. Let's plan what's the best organizational structure for what we've got to do going forward, figure out how we're going to transition there and get beyond the decisions that we made um, uh, in the past. And so we've got some ideas about how you can go and do that. Um, lots of opportunities for the leadership team. And by leadership team here, I mean really anybody who's a supervisor and, and manager and above. Lots of opportunities to really work on what leadership means. What are the responsibilities of leadership that go beyond just being able to check off the tasks that are on your to-do list of, 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 of workload every day? Mentoring, team building, coaching, uh, decision making, prioritizing, time management, these are the kinds of things that I think about um, are, that are good qualities of an effective leader. Creativity uh, is, is another important attribute and that's something you can't really teach. Uh, you have to more nurture it and, and try to find those folks that are more creative and help them um, get into positions where they can, they can make up for folks that maybe aren't quite as creative. But that, those kinds of opportunities exist and we've got some ideas of how you can um, improve that in the organization. So that's the current situation analysis. A quick overview of the benchmarking. Hard to summarize this when you see, if you've seen the report, um, you know, there's 50 slides on this, uh, a, lot of, a lot of detailed information. It, it requires some thought and some consideration and some examination to really put it all into perspective. We tried to raise it up to the right level. Um, and most of the benchmarks, the utilities performing well, uh, I put an asterisk by some of these things that you need to look at very carefully. In particular, I can draw your attention to the last two where we look at the distribution O&M expenditures per circuit mile by how much infrastructure you have and then per the number of customers that you serve. And in generally speaking, when those numbers are lower, it, is, it could be a sign of efficiency that you're really effective at getting your O&M done. You're not, you're not wasting money. But if you're not spending enough you could misinterpret the results because it also could be, you know, it's just you're not putting enough into O&M. So you need to think about it in terms of other things. Um, and here with, I think what you're going to hear tonight about um, the condition of the infrastructure, um, while the net metric is better than the average of your peers, that may not be a good thing. That may be a warning sign for you to pay attention to. So that's, that's one of the important things to think about. Um, you know, you're kind of in the middle in terms of financial performance and that's improving. That's due primarily to the adjustments that you've begun to make to deal with the declining, uh, declining uh, kilowatt hour sales. Had you not made those changes, that would, you would not be in good shape there. And these numbers were based at the end of calendar year 2013 as filed at the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. We haven't had the time or the resource to do an update to say, um, you are at least a year later than that, and I think those filings were made not too long ago. It would be good to go back and take an update and see if you've made progress. I'm pretty certain that based on uh, the rate changes that you made, you might see some improvement in the operating income per revenue dollar and the operating ratio. Those might be moving back towards the average. Depends on what the other utilities in the sample did. 
but it's something that you know, could relatively be easily looked at. And the point with these are is if you just do this once and walk away, you wasted your time. You've got to pick these benchmarks that are the most important and relevant to you and the challenges that you're facing and then use them to measure your progress over time. So at least once a year, come back and look at this. So maybe uh, you know, next year when the same filings are made, that's a good time to stop, run it through the spreadsheet and see how you measure up and keep an eye on, on how you're doing with those benchmarks. And then remember, um, comparing yourself to your peers is, is important. It's a good thing, but it's not nearly as important as setting a goal and then measuring your progress towards that goal through these benchmarks. And that's where we hope as you do a strategic plan update that we're recommending, you'll set some objectives in that strategic plan and then you'll use these benchmarks or some other metrics to measure your progress. So, you know, benchmark yourself first towards your goals, then benchmark yourself towards your peers as kind of a sanity check to see how you're doing. Do it on a frequent enough basis where you're getting feedback and you're using it to judge your progress towards uh, um, measuring the success of the changes that you're making. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so many of these are, are quantitatively based, so you know, there's a They're all quantitative. Uh, mm -hmm. performance measure. So is there any reason we can't add this to, let's say, a quarterly dashboard that we've talked about? Uh, in the, I mean, we're doing a monthly dashboard, but is there any reason we couldn't do a quarterly or maybe a, a uh, every six month dashboard that captures some of this? I have an answer, but I think he's asking staff, yeah. Right. I would caution you to pick the right ones if you're going to look at it that frequently, particularly things like O&M expense where it, doesn't, it comes out lumpy. You know, you're, if you set a quarterly goal, that, then you could measure against quarterly progress, but generally it's annual. And if you look at it quarterly, um, if, you're, if you're trying to do it as a warning sign, that's part, that might be a good idea. I it think just we'd be happy to, doing it annually, just for, you know, for your For sure annually would be a and I was curious whether we could actually generate the data uh, from the metrics that you got up here. Yep. We see a lot of utilities look at metrics on a more regular basis, particularly things like uh, the uh, operating income um, and, and, and the so more um, granular, or I can't think of the, the word I'm looking for, those financial statistics that, that tend to really represent performance on a monthly or a quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. It's very common for utilities to report those um, and, and put them on a chart that's presented to the board. Reliability, um, outage statistics is, is reported oftentimes. Um, power power uh, cost, I think you guys already do that, and I think that comes out in, in one of your reports here. Yeah, I think John's point is good. I think what at a high level, it, it, I think it argues for a scorecard yeah. on a regular basis. I think annual metrics are fine, but you know, you can't do much with them. I mean, it's too, too, too big a chunk of time, but I would look based on the report at some financial measures, but there's a lot of human capital things that we want to move the needle on. So I know it's hard to express, but you know, how many- Vacant positions. Yeah, mm -hmm. or how many CDP plans have been completed, or you know, we can think about and work with staff on that, but I, I think a, a scorecard would be helpful. Uh, the, the question I had was around uh, the per customer metric. So do you, do you attempt to normalize, because obviously not all customers are created equal, and in some towns, you know, there's some significant size customers, so is the assumption that just all averages out? No, we, 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 we do it in the, in the narrative, Tom. Uh, for example, if you do comparisons per customer against, I think it's Holyoke, that's the one that's, you know, much smaller than you, the denominator really drives their numbers up. And so, you know, their, their, their values are skewed quite a bit from yours. But I think we put notes in there that, that, that remind you that there's differences in that utility that you need to take into consideration. We don't try to mathematically normalize it. We stick to the APPA methods, the American Public Power Association, because we don't have to explain our approach if we can conform with what the industry's doing. So that's, you know, in all these metrics, we're trying yeah, to stick I, I with I guess theirs. I was, maybe I didn't word it correctly, I, what I was really thinking of is there may be some huge uh, commercial enterprises that we're servicing here in Reading. Mm -hmm. So that's a customer, and each of our board members are customers. So if it's a service level metric on customer service, you know, the, it probably is true that the amount of service required for those bigger sure. accounts is different. So I just, I just wondered if that gets factored in or is it maybe in the, uh, in the grand scheme of things that it doesn't all. doesn't mathematically, yep. but it does it does just in a, quanti a qualitative or narrative assessment of the res interpretation of the results. Okay. Thank you. Um, we looked at uh, salary, salary comparisons of some selected positions. Uh, there's there's room to improve 
uh, it, it, certainly in some areas, uh, you're a little bit maybe over the mark in others. But in general, I would say that um, salary and compensation are not limiting factors for you in terms of your ability to recruit and retain people. Uh, you have a pretty good, pretty good program here. Uh, the bigger challenge is just folks aren't interested in getting into this business and, and the investments that need to be made are in STEM programs and working with your community colleges and your, and your regional colleges to develop interest. And then you're competing against, um, you know, you're competing against National Grid and, and, and the other larger players who, um, they recruit. They go out to colleges and recruit and, and they, they have uh, internships for students that, you know, uh, um, th that make it very attractive to them. And sometimes that's not bad. You can, you know, then you should be targeting maybe the engineer that's gone through that program at National Grid that's got three or four years under the belt, but they're not going to go anywhere for another five years. Those are the guys that you can, and, and gals that you can go after and try to get them interested in coming over and seeing the value and working in public power. Lots of things that you can do. And APPA has invested tons of in, in, in resources and coming up with ways to help solve that problem. So there's lots of good tools out there for you to look at. And well, use. I, I think uh, we, we have the same challenge. Uh, we, we're an industrial specialty manufacturer and what we found though in our recent recruiting strategies, similar to you know, public utilities, we, we have a huge environmental impact with the use of our products. And then what we're finding is millennials and uh, some of the uh, out of college uh, folks that really resonates in fact I know we've hired three people recently whose attraction to the company was that you know kind of save the environment and conscious of uh, energy and, yep. and so forth so it's, it gets back to I think what you said in terms of the, the recruitment strategy and, and the communications of your value proposition yeah I think today you know if I was to uh, you know, put it at a high level I think your recruiting strategies today are just out of date uh, you know, you're, you're, you're rec recruiting like you did 10, 20 years ago, and it, it doesn't work. You need to have a different approach. Uh, our best practices. So we looked at some 25 or more categories of best practices, and within there, there's six or seven different best practices. I don't know what the whole total number is, but it's a bunch. Um, and uh, uh, we've developed these over time. Um, compared, you know, use, use our, every time we go, go through with this process, I learn something more uh, than I did going in, so we continue to, to build the quality of what we think are the best practices. Um, and you guys are setting the standard in some areas. I think that some of the things that uh, Mark Vivani has done um, in the IT side, uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with, and I think it kind of sets the bar uh, for some utilities. You have the, the luxury here of having a guy like Mark in your organization, many municipals, the marks are over at the town, and it's a shared uh, it's a shared resource. So they're serving public safety, they're serving public works and other utility functions, and and you get a slice of their time. Having Mark here uh, in, in that um, uh, IT role is a blessing, and some things are going on here that, as a result of that that are really positive, and, and I think um, you should be very encouraged about. So you know where you're meeting best practices, uh, competitively priced services. Um, I think that's a good thing, you know, you're still living in the last strategic plan which said we want to be the low cost provider. I don't think that's a sustainable strategy anymore and, and you need to really look at that and, and if you decide to invest in, in updating your 2008 strategic plan, I hope that becomes um, a topic that you'll think about. Uh, you need to be competitive, you need to be fair. But, you, you know, it, it costs the organization, it costs the enterprise to be the low-cost provider, especially if you do it over a long period of time. You know, usually being a low-cost provider is a market entrance strategy. It's, it's generally not a market survival strategy unless you are um, uh, able to really be creative in how you do that. And, and you guys have been out of balance in that regard. Um, and you're paying the price for it now and trying to catch up uh, in, in some areas. The resource efficiency and conservation side, you guys are, are certainly doing a, an excellent job. Um, you know, demand response in the public power space is not uh, um, is not really widespread yet. It's growing, uh, and and so it's exciting to see that you guys are paying attention to that. Um, lots of um, uh, programs for customers. Work needs to be done in outreach and marketing those programs, but you've got a wide selection uh, to look at, and I, and I think that's a good thing. So we give you high marks in that regard. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, there's five areas where we, uh, we think you're behind, uh, behind the curve and, and you need to invest time and energy in. 
that's the workforce development, the organizational effectiveness, uh, leadership development, work management, and project management. Uh, I think we talked about most of those issues. Uh, work management, I learned today uh, that uh, Mark and Hamid and others are working on some exciting things in that regard and automating service and work order processes and moving information out into the field to where it's needed. Um, you're at the beginning of that journey, uh, but you're moving in the right direction, so I think that's a good thing. Project management, uh, I think you've got a lot of room there to, to improve. Uh, and if you, you know, a measure of, of project management is, uh, you know, are you getting the work done that you're asking to get done, that you're budgeting to get done? And there's lots of reasons why that may not be happening, but you, you will always do better if you invest in better project management. Not everybody needs to be a project manager, but you need to have some folks that are, that are very good at it. Uh, what I see some utilities do that are struggling in that regard is they'll go out and they'll hire some pro people who are just really good project managers and they'll give them a portfolio of work. They aren't subject matter experts, they aren't, they aren't electrical distribution engineers, they're really good project managers and they will own a project and then they'll work the resources that need to get that work done. So that's a, a strategy that you might think about. As you, as you get the opportunity to hire new people, Hiring folks with a project management professional certification is an important thing to think about, and we're encouraging you to put that into your recruiting, put that into your job descriptions, provide that kind of training to your people who need it to help them improve their project management skills. I think you'll be rewarded for those, um, for those investments. Uh, and then there's a whole smattering of areas in the middle, I think, where you're, you're doing really well, uh, or you're making good progress towards doing well. Uh, GIS, safety, risk management, strategic planning, uh, uh, you know, you recognize things that you need to do. Uh, we've talked about it, and, and, and your, your, your people are, know that they're, they want to implement and, and, and do more and do better in those regards, so we, we reflect that in our assessment. Any questions on the best practices? Um, some of the key areas, were, you know, the workforce development, I'll drill down quickly into these five areas. Uh, we're talking about you know, forecasting your future workforce needs. Tonight you approved a uh, $10.5 million budget, but none of you asked how many people is it going to take to get that work done and do we have enough. Classic example of a shortfall in, in understanding the, the workforce needs going forward. Um, something to think about. The succession plan for key positions, we talked about that tonight. We've got a lot of, lot of folks that are uh, nearing the end of their careers that, that, that carry a lot of responsibility for the enterprise. There's nobody yet to back them up if they leave. Um, I know Colleen and, and her team are working on succession plans, but there's still a lot to be done um, uh, in that area. Have, have uh, you done work in the succession plan area? Oh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, when in private industry, many times uh, senior managers are charged with finding their successor and developing them as part of their reward system, compensation system. And if they don't do it, but I don't know how it works in a utility. You're encumbered. Uh, you're encumbered by a couple of things. The civil service structure in general doesn't really promote that. And in particular, where your um, most of your workforce is um, uh, working as a part of a collective bargaining unit, succession planning is prescribed by the next guy with a m number of years in service as your successor. And you know, so they take care of that from a math problem, but it doesn't solve the getting the work done problem. And it doesn't mean that the person who's succeeding is the right one. Um, what we do in succession planning is we certainly, we help develop succession plans. We help identify successors. Uh, we help develop career development plans for those people and make sure that you get them on the right track. And we vet you know, and, and review what suggestions for career, career development. So uh, uh, Colleen might develop career development plans, or excuse me, succession plans for her, her key positions, uh, and we would provide an opinion about do we really think that they've done the right things? Have you, you know, really thought about all the things that need to be thought about? So Thank you. those are the kind of things that we can work on. Um, updating your job descriptions. Most of the job descriptions that you have here are very much out of date. Uh, they don't reflect the challenges that you're dealing with going forward. They don't address the workforce that you're trying to attract. And, and we're encouraging you to, to really invest in trying to update those um, to help you prepare for that. It doesn't mean you have to do them all at once, but you know, focus on those that are most important. Focus on those where you're having a hard time recruiting and hiring and make sure you've got the right job description out there. Steve, was that a challenge from, because typically that, that would be the foundation for your benchmarking of compensation was that challenging for the compensation benchmarking knowing that the positions you 
were looking for weren't exactly, uh, but I know you did interview, so maybe that. Yeah, I mean, we, um, we, had to, we had to really put a lot of thought into making sure we were comparing the right positions and the other enterprises to make sure that we have the right things. Um, I can't tell you that we dove into their job descriptions to determine whether or not we thought they were appropriate for what we're doing going forward. Right. Um, we, we probably didn't do that. Uh, I, and if I was going to bet money, I bet money that most of the other utilities are in the same position. Sure. Uh, there'll be exceptions, but I think the trend is that you know you're not that far off the mark with a lot of other utilities who are who are facing the same challenges. Um, a consistent performance appraisal performance process, one of the real Achilles heels here, uh, because of the collective bargaining agree agreements that were struck, the way that they're designed, and the 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 uh, incremental increases that are prescribed to you. I think less emphasis has been on performance appraisal um, than, than, than you should have and, and just the mechanics of getting it done, you got to rethink, um, make sure that you understand how important that is to you and put the right level of effort into getting it done. Um, for new people coming in, you know, not having a meaningful performance <coughs> appraisal system is probably the reason that they won't stay. I mean, if they, if they don't get the feedback and see a path forward to understand what they could do, you know, they're, they're, you're gonna have a hard time keeping their attention. Less important for somebody who's um, much, much further along in their career, but still, I think, very important to do. Steve, if you were to, or excuse me, if you were to think about all of the <clears throat> work you've done for other utilities, is there one that stands out in your mind that, that ex exceeds at doing these types of things that we might be able to copy? Yeah, I mean, and, and we, we do it brazenly. You know, every time we, every time we uh, enter into an engagement and we see something that's working really well, that sets the bar for our best practice, and then we take that and we share that with you. Um, and, and you do it amongst yourselves. You do it with APPA. Uh, you know, there's, there's lots of examples out there um, that, are, that are doing it, and there's any number of them that we could point you to that, to help, to help you do that. That might be helpful later on to yeah. point us to one or two of those sure. that we could perhaps use as a... As a model. It's not a lack of it's not a lack of um, data and, and that kind of information that's out there in the industry that's your that's your challenge. It's the ability to reflect or understand that that's imp the important thing to be working on now and then go out and take advantage of it. Yeah, I mean, I think you pointed out something that should have been more obvious, but I mean, everything you presented really speaks for a pay for performance kind of environment and culture to be more competitive, but structurally. Uh, you know, it's not the fault of the general manager or the staff. That's, yeah. you know, with the, the way the labor force is organized, you you have to uh, set up your reward system differently. And it's a trend. I mean, people are moving in that direction. Uh, utilities are moving in that direction to be able to do that. It's not quite like the private industry where it's typically almost all pay for performance yes. uh, because hey, you're still encumbered. Can I but make a comment? Yes. Um, we d I did change the line worker and the new tech services group to... Um, performance-based step raises. Right. Um, the next challenge would be your middle management IBEW. And um, yeah. good. That's that's progress. But that'll be a challenge. Yep, I'm <laughs> sure. And we talked uh, about accelerating your rec recruiting efforts. So I won't go into that anymore. But you know, I mean, really, I, that's super important. Um, Organizational effectiveness, uh, you know, we have made some reorganization recommendations um, uh, to Colleen. Uh, the, I guess the highlight of that is in the long view, in the ultimate RMLD X.0, whether it's 2.0 or 3.0, but you know, where, where we would like to see you go is not far afield from where you are today. Um, you have an engineering and operations division uh, we're recommending, um, uh, you have a business and accounting division that you call it today. Uh, we think of that more as a finance and accounting division. So it's just, it's a little more oriented to a broader part of your business. And it's really focusing on um, you know, process improvement, project management, uh, more than just the accounting function that you really are taking on today, which is the primary focus of that. So all of those things that are kind of not operational in terms of the field, that are not customer facing and that are not resource driven belong in a in, in kind of the business part of the organization. So it's what you have now expanded. Um, the engineering and operations uh, division remains largely unchanged. Some of the things that they're doing now get moved into business and finance, allowing um, ENO to focus more on uh, on the grid assets that need to be uh, that need to be taken care of. And then the real difference is we're proposing a fourth division that's customer service. 
that really is focused on the customer facing part of the business uh, programs and, and, and you know, the, the, those kinds of things that you need to do to keep up with where the rest of the world is going in customer service. Uh, you know, uh, at utilities, we are in the stone age of customer service still compared to, to what every, almost every other touch point that a, um, a, per, a, a customer has, whether it's with their bank, with their medical provider, with their telecommunications <coughs> company, with their cable TV company, is vastly different than the experience that they get here. Uh, and so there's a lot of, a lot of ground to make up, and, and I don't think you're going to be as successful doing that if customer service is not at the same level as other key parts of the organization. But it's going to take you time to get there. We're not suggesting that that's something that gets turned on tomorrow. Uh, and really, it's for Colleen and her team to decide the, the strategies about how um, moving from where you are today to get there. Those are the details that they're best left to figure out and solve, we're happy to provide our, our ideas and opinions to vote what's gonna work and what's not, but I think that's the 30,000 foot view of, of where we think organizationally you need to go. The real important part of it is, let's get away from organizing around people problems, and let's organize around what's best for the utility and, 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 and making the utility stronger um, to take on these future challenges. Um, I think I talked about all of those things there. Oh. I want to skip it over. Communications, big deal. Uh, you know, you've, uh, c communications is, is, is always important. I think it's particularly important when you're in an environment where you're trying to break down silos, um, get teams to be more collaborative, more supportive. That requires communications across channels that probably weren't used before. Um, it requires somebody in the organization to take on and own communications on the internal side. Uh, some utilities uh, we'll have a public information, public information officer that really owns the communication process for the organization, both customer facing and inward facing. So there's some ideas that uh, we presented that you can think about how to do that. Um, and you need to plan this out and make commitments to what communication are we going to do, how frequently, what is the content, who is the audience, how are we going to measure the effectiveness. You know, take it on as a serious business function, not as, a, uh, not as just another thing that gets done. Um, uh, in parallel with whatever else you're working on at the time. Um, assessing the organizational culture and employee satisfaction. I think if you're going to make changes to try to improve the organization, if you can't quantify that improvement, you're probably not going to be able to really understand how successful you are. So some tools to help set the benchmark for that is um, uh, an exercise that you go through to, uh, through a survey instrument try to establish the difference between how an individual, uh, what an individual's values are in terms of um, you know, a number of different measures that you can come up with, whether it's ethics, honesty, um, uh, accountability, and there's a whole laundry list, and how they see the organization. And when there's a big gap between how an individual sees itself and how that individual sees the organization that it works for, we call that um, cultural entropy. So it's unorganized energy that's sitting there waiting to do something, and it's generally not something that's good. It ends up going in kind of negative places in the enterprise. And if you can minimize that cultural entropy, people move into a place where they're more willing to accept change, they're more trusting, uh, you know, they're willing to take more risk. Uh, personal risk means signing up to take on a task to help implement a, a tactic or a strategy as a part of a, a plan to, to make improvements. And it's, it's the direction that you want to go. This instrument gives you some numerical measurements of where your cultural values lie and allows you to, over time, retake that survey maybe every year or every other year and see if you're making progress towards you want to go. Again, you can measure uh, and, and see the progress that you're making. Uh, and then the same thing with uh, an employee survey where we, uh, we go through an anonymous survey process and, and we design the, the survey with you come up with those issues that we think are most important that you want to get some kind of metric back on, satisfaction, uh, longevity, how long do you think you're going to be around, uh, what's important to you. There's a whole list of these questions that we can ask and, and then you come back and look at the results and it might say that 30% um, of my employees are very satisfied, 30% uh, of my employees are somewhat satisfied, and 40% and, uh, of my employees are not satisfied at all. And you can say that my goal is to reduce the number of, un uh, of unsatisfied employees to 20% in two years. Now you come back, you, you implement some changes, you understand what they're unsatisfied about, try to make corrections, and then two years later, redo the survey and see how you're doing. That's just one, one example of, of what the employee survey does. 
So we think that's an important thing for you to think about doing. Uh, leadership development. Um, before you invest in significant organizational changes, we think you really need to take a good look at, at your leadership team. And this can go you know, from at least uh, the uh, general manager or director, general manager to the directors and maybe the director's direct reports, I would say at a minimum is the right level to look at. And uh, the leadership assessment is much like the culture values assessments, much more focused, much more detailed. Uh, it reflects um, how an individual sees themselves and then you, know, you select 15 or 20 um, uh, individuals that are uh, impacted by that leader and they provide their input. And now you get to see how um, managers and supervisors are viewed by their subordinates and understand then what's the entropy between how that manager sees himself and how the employees see that manager and you look for the limiting factors that need to be overcome to allow that manager to become a more effective leader or to understand where you can't set expectations that are beyond that leader's ability to deliver. So it's really important to know that as you begin to think about uh, what you might do in terms of, of the organization. Steve, is that kind of similar to a 360? Basically? It is. Yeah. Yep, it's, it's the Barrett Learning Center's version of a 360. Um, that's done by an independent third party. We, we don't do it because we, you know, if, we hope to have a relationship with you um, that allows us to, to help you get value out of the investment you made in getting here. Getting to that level of detail uh, with individual leaders in the organization, we could compromise our trust and our ability to work with you. So we bring an independent expert in uh, and they do that, that part of the work and, and come back and provide their opinion. And the, the woman that we use for it, um, um, you know, if you ever wanted to talk to some of the folks that have been through it, the, some of the other utility managers that have used her, they love it. She's very, very effective. Uh, she has this a magical ability to, uh, to be very forthright and, and clear with some of the worst news that she could ever deliver uh, it, without it becoming destructive. It's a, real, it's a rare talent, yep. and uh, it's really fun to watch her work. Uh, management leadership training. Um, you know, you, we've talked about career development plans. Uh, a lot of focus is on technical skills and, and, and other kinds of things. I think there's room for improvement in, in management and leadership skills here too. And some training needs to be thought about in that. Some uh, opportunities for the management leadership team to do things together. Uh, you know, some kind of team building exercises I think would be a good thing to build trust and, and, and confidence in one another. And then the cross-divisional management training, particularly in an environment where you're worried about succession planning, uh, I think the idea of giving managers an opportunity to spend time in their colleagues' shoes in other parts of the organization is a good idea. Um, even if it's just a week, you know, sitting in that other position, I think it really heightens their understanding of what goes on in the organization and gives them maybe a different perspective on, on, on how people could be working together. So those are some ideas on what to do in leadership development. Uh, project management recommendations, we talked about this at length. Uh, I, we, we think you need some project management policies and procedures, better training, uh, uh, hire some project management experts uh, in your new recruiting efforts, and really establish expectations of folks that have project management responsibilities, delivering projects on time, uh, multitasking, you know, managing schedules and budgets and those kinds of things. Um, work management, um, you guys are the Flintstones when it comes to work management. Uh, like a lot of utilities. Yeah, I mean, we're still dealing with paper timesheets and, you know, time lags between the time work is done until the time uh, feedback about whether that work was done well uh, within your ex estimate ex of expectations and time. Modern utilities, uh, utilities that are really implementing modern work management systems, there's a lot of solutions that are available to you out there uh, that give you a, a, the ability to working within the utilities accounting structure, the way FERC accounts are set up, the way work orders are opened and managed. I mean, it just it automates that process and it makes the information more useful to folks that are trying to make decisions, more uh, useful to folks who are trying to forecast fu future workforce needs. Um, I've seen work management systems that, that tie into the capital budget that when you build capital and operating budgets, you provide inputs into the work management system to forecast future workforce needs so that you can also understand do I have enough FTEs to reasonably expect to be able to get the work done that I'm asking you to, um, to fund? So that's just some examples. 
Um, it's not all about software and tools. It's also about business processes. <coughs> and you have very few well-documented or engineered business processes in the organization. You have some, but you need more. And having some around project management would be a really good idea. Building on things I know that Hamid has already started on. So Steve, sometimes that's a function of scale of the organization in terms of what level of technology you want to implement. And there's always a crossover point between paper-based Flintstone systems and, and sort of modern technology, you know, whether it's mobile-based or computer. Uh, I would assume that your uh, assessment would be that we're certainly well beyond the point of, of needing that type of uh, management or technology use. Well, I think you're, you're, I think you're scratching the surface of it now. You don't use it. You, don't have, you have really no work management automation here at all. A little tiny bit. A little tiny bit. And, you're, and, and I think the folks that need it the most see it, and they're, they're working on it. Um, I was you know, talking with Mark. He stepped out of the room. I don't see him now. But you know, the, he's working on uh, work management solutions uh, to help uh, improve the success of the metering upgrade project that's coming down the pipeline. And that is something that could be expanded. The real art to making that work, um, and one of the hardest things, is to try to get away from the idea that I need to go out and buy a system that's customized for me. Because once you do that, trying to keep it up to date becomes almost impossible. You know, the, the constant customization and the, and, and the attention and care. It's way easier to retune your business processes to fit a tool that can help you. You have to make some adjustments on your side, do things a little bit differently. Um, and when you, when, you're, when you are that flexible um, and open-minded and willing to undertake that kind of change, it's much easier to implement these kinds of tools. Um, and utilities are doing it all the time. It's just, uh, you know, some, some get it and, and are moving faster. They value it more highly than others. Um, and, and there's lots of them, you know, that are just like our MLD that know it's important but can't quite figure out how to take the right steps to move forward and get it done. But as you have, you know, a, as workforce becomes a bigger and bigger constraint, it already is, and as it becomes a bigger constraint, your ability to manage what you have becomes more and more important. And you've got to think about tools to creatively help you understand uh, the ability to forecast and prioritize work to be able to get the right thing done with the people that you have. When you don't do that, you tend to take on the easy stuff and kick the harder stuff down the road until it becomes something that's, you know, smoking. And then you can Thank focus you. on that. Uh, so that is, I think that's it. Oh, we <coughs> provided, uh, it's, this is an eye test, so I don't expect you to read it. It's in your presentation. 52 recommendations. We prioritized them over a uh, uh, three and a half year implementation schedule. This is the first step in this prioritization. Now, uh, the, the trick is to, uh, um, you know, the, Colleen and her team will look at this and decide what's important to them and pick and choose what they want to move on the first and what do they want to move on second. Um, but the roadmap's there. Uh, it'll work if you, you know, if you can, if you can navigate that. Uh, I think you're going to be in much better shape than, than you are now. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Steve, just one sure, question, uh, if you can answer it. So from the, the board's perspective is, are there anything you would recommend that we be doing more of in terms of supporting? Because most of what we have talked about, obviously, that Colleen and the team will be responsible for working on, and we need to be supportive. But is there any anything you would ask uh, that the board maybe take a more careful look at in terms of supporting? Uh, I always tell people yeah. at work, you know, tell me if we can be helpful, but tell me if we're being too helpful. So we don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to interfere with uh, progress. But I just wondered if there's, because some of these things are more difficult than others, obviously. Then. You know, I will tell you, um, I would say our, uh, our assessment, and this is as unbiased as it can be, is I think, you know, you've made some really smart decisions about who you brought on to run the utility. Um, and, and while it has not been um, painless, uh, you know, it's, you, there's this constant question is, am I doing enough? Am I doing it fast enough? And am I willing to take the casualties that I have to take in order to keep moving forward? Um, and you'll be tested in continuing to support when, when, when those kinds of things begin to become more apparent. So I, I would encourage you to trust in the decisions that you've made and, and continue to provide that support. 
Um, I would love to see you go in the direction that you talked about earlier, get down to, the, to, to a set of, of uh, um, measurable metrics that you can use that distill all of this complexity down um, to something that's simple that you can in a timely fashion understand whether your support is getting what you need in terms of the, the changes that you want. So a scorecard that yeah. um, if you make it too complex, it'll fail. Right. Right. If you pick the wrong metrics, it'll fail. I see it happen all the time. Uh, it, or it becomes just a process that nobody really pays attention to. So staff scrambles to get the data put together to make sure that it's in the packet that comes to you. It never really gets analyzed and looked at because it's too, too complex, too detailed, too many issues, and you can't look at it. So keep it down to four or five really you know, key things that you have the time to talk about uh, when, the time is right, um, when the time is right to talk about it. Great. Um, but I, you know, I think, I think you're, you're definitely going in the right direction, and it's a good thing. Uh, I think when we, uh, if, uh, if, if you decide to move forward into uh, a, a more thoughtful strategic planning process, um, I think you know, getting yourself involved in that and, and helping set a vision uh, that the utility can, can work to in the strategic plan would be very important. Um, the strategic plan that you got, my assessment of it, the one from 2008 or so, is the kind of strategic plan that was written by two or three people behind closed doors. Um, and it was, you know, it's, it's a, it, it, you know, more yeah. of a business plan than a strategic plan. Yeah. Um, and and if, you, if you want to entertain it, go to APPA. You know, they, have, they have stuff designed for you as go the governance board to help you understand what is your role in developing a strategic plan, broken down into real simple stuff. If you're inclined, if you're going to go to the APPA National Conference or, uh, you know, as, as I would encourage you to do over time, they have uh, pre-conference workshops all the time on strategic planning for governance. Uh, so maybe having a subset of you or a strategic plan committee, if that happens to come out, invest some time and energy in that. I think that would probably be a very good thing for you to think about doing too. Good. Anything else? I, I just wanted to yeah, thank sure. uh, you and your team. I think it's a very thorough analysis uh, and gives a roadmap, I think, for going forward. I, I'd also like to say I haven't been part of on both sides of <laughs> this kind of presentation, I, and you alluded to it. It's a little... Uh, dissettling for staff and management team even because you're really uh, putting your team out there if, you know, for complete transparency and assessment and of course who doesn't have improvement needs and opportunities but I, I think your last slide probably said it best I mean obviously it's not that everything is bad or wrong but to be competitive uh, we're going to yeah. keep moving forward so I, I just acknowledge that there's a lot of good things as, as, as uh, acknowledged earlier good. well thank you Good. I'd like to suggest we take a bio break for yeah. five minutes, or depending how long the queue is. Yeah. That's right. Sure. <laughs> okay, Dave so already we'll started it, I think. Try to resume at, uh, <laughs> I guess, 10 of. Is that One of the three days. <laughs> One of the three. All right. that light better. Well, I saw one of the old commissioners come in and move it. Can't remember her name.
starter. <laughs> like a little pro. I don't do it at home. With the microphone. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've been the recipient of the no, On the head, right? Yeah. How was the uh, chairmanship bathrooms? Were they good? The chairman bathroom? Yeah, you know, just uh, the normal marble and the <laughs> amenities, you know, the toiletries. Yeah. And yes, yes. Free razors. Was there a person and, presenting you a towel as you came? Towel right and a take-home bag, a travel bag. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the <laughs> Yeah, swag. <laughs> yeah, swag. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope that's not on the recording. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Uh, we actually, uh, Ken, uh, if you don't mind, we have some representatives here from uh, the uh, Climate Action Committee. Climate Action Committee. Climate Thank you. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Joan Virgil, Joan, and uh, Gina Snyder. As I said, they're from the Reading Climate Advisory Co Committee. So the background is we uh, need to discuss, I guess, the future of the committee. It's now in terms of the uh, direction that uh, it is given uh, the, the town has in the past uh, the selectmen have appointed members to I the can give you a little more oh, sorry, I don't mean to oh please yes absolutely mr. chairman yes um, you have the floor vice chair good. I'm sorry uh, no so please the, I, I just because I talked to the town manager about, about mm -hmm. this um, and I guess what we face is that next Tuesday the board of selectmen are going to be meeting with uh, you guys to decide what the future will be because your committee sunsets on June 30th um, and I'm certainly of the opinion that the town you know needs uh, this voice and and the emissions reduction strategy and sustainability uh, advice uh, across the town and schools and RMLD so I'm certainly hopeful the selectmen will uh, continue uh, in addition to which I think the RMLD earlier tonight we heard um, you know that if we could communicate with a thousand people with electric water heaters we could shave two megawatts off of our off of our demand so there's a need for communications in our community that that some some form of committee could help us with so pending whatever the selectmen do um you know we, we could discuss you know what the future so if there's anything you guys would like to say please come on up and um take the mic and yes you have please do yeah just to uh, piggyback on what uh, dave said so i think we all support the great work that the committee's doing so that's uh, certainly uh, our position yeah there's a mic if you want to if you want to you can come right up to the table right. yeah you, no that's that mic's not working you do have you know how this works you do have to <laughs> use that one sorry yeah <laughs> uh unfortunately Gina, that one doesn't work so we have to oh, send you back to oh, oh is that right um, oh yeah these are too pretty <laughs> for letting us come up a little earlier in the agenda. Um, the Climate Committee's worked in, in Reading for over 10 years on a broad mission statement. Um, one of the first things we did under the Cities for Climate Protection was analyze the greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Cool Planet program. And I got to say, Colleen, I know you weren't here, but the Light Department was extraordinarily helpful and has been a wonderful partner all through when there is a program that we're trying to do that involves electricity or energy efficiency. But we have a lot more. The biggest emissions in Reading were from transportation. So we've done a lot of work with that. Sustainability, recycling, we have a green sense column. We reach out to the schools. We were talking to the kids about alternative fuel vehicles. So our program's really quite broad. And um, we, would, we would love to work with the light department to set up a four town committee that might reach out and do more sustainability work and maybe even you know more focused on electricity because that's what your needs are right now but as far as the Reading Climate Committee we do feel that there's still a lot of work in Reading we've got very good partnerships right now we're working with Tom with the, um, the community shared solar program which was an outgrowth of the local energy action plan which I hope you've all had a chance to read um, there was a little hiatus there, but it's back on track, and we're doing this wonderful project with the light department. Great. And we do enjoy, like I said, love working with the light department, want to do it some more, but we've got a broad mission here in town, and, and we are going to, uh, you know, seek to continue with the Board of Selectmen. Okay. Oh, great. Questions? So, um, 
I have just one question. Uh, do our other towns uh, have similar types of committees? No, they don't. Glenfield doesn't. Glenfield doesn't? There's been a lot of interest from North Reading with the new uh, town manager. So uh, we're hoping that they might be uh, like a second tier adopter of uh, shared solar. Yeah, I, my personal opinion was just that. I think uh, since we serve four towns, it would be nice to have the collaborative yeah. effort if we decide to move forward. A, a number of years ago when they were doing the big 350, <laughs> um, trying to keep CO2 down to 350, yep. um, we did an outreach program for all four towns. Um, we had uh, someone from Linfield, someone from North Reading. I think Wilmington wasn't able to make it. We actually had someone from Melrose oh. come up and we sort of had that little workshop and, and a discussion of, we actually found out about the new no idling near the schools that the, uh, that the um, Registry of Motor Vehicles adopted in 2009 through Melrose. So, you know, there is a lot to be learned from these other communities. Um, and I, I think it would be great if we could get something started here. Good. May I, uh, yes, please. So, do, to, so I understand anyway. Your plan is that next Tuesday you'll be talking to the selectmen and advocating to continue as a committee under the selectmen. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, we're doing our annual report and uh, re-upping. Okay, great. So, um, well, I think what we, I think my my opinion would be, we'll let's we'll wait to see what happens next Tuesday, and this hopefully the selectmen will, you know, want to carry on and maybe expand the mission. And um, certainly a lot of work to be done. That's for for sure. A lot of education that's needed. So, and then after that, we can we can see where we are. Yeah. Just one Bill, yes, sir. Chairman, I'd like to say that you know I think this board should support and recommend the select that they reappoint that to this committee and allow them to do their continued work. Yeah, I mean, and I think sure. that's a, that's a message that the committee should take to the selectmen and start with that. Thank you. The board, yeah. That the board is behind them in getting reappointed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I would agree with I would that. Agree. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Me too. Thank you very much. You have our support. Thank you. Any other comments from the board or Dave? Do you have no. Comments? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you for all the good work that you've done and will continue to do. We all support it. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Joan, for your work. Yes, thank you, Joan. Okay. Ken, you can come out of the dugout. <laughs> Deal with Booth and Associates, and we conducted the uh, reliability study. And pleasure to be back uh, with you after uh, I guess Stephen referenced our first meeting in the fall. Yep. Um, we do have Jim Turley and William Parrish here, and I'll reference them in a few minutes. They've been up all week doing some training, so we'll be talking about that in a, in a little while. So, and first of all, you know, we titled this project the System Electric Reliability Study. Well. Um, this study, Tina, if you've had a chance to read through it, that it touches on a whole lot more than just the electric system reliability. We basically analyzed every aspect of the uh, electric system. Um, part of the process was to conduct site visits, collect data on the system, and we expressed our appreciation to Hamid, his staff, for getting us the uh, requested data so we could get as an extensive and complete of a study as, as we could. Um, we did conduct three site visits uh, and uh, perform condition assessments. Mostly those are, are just typical visual inspections. Um, we took all this data and all the uh, observations from our field surveys back to the office and uh, assigned those to the appropriate people with the expertise to analyze and, and come up with a set of recommendations for you. During the field assessment, uh, John Sidebotham from our substation and protective coordination department uh, came up and examined the uh, substation facilities. Uh, William Parrish and David Huffstetler came up and uh, as a twosome spent a, around a week up here and rode and saw as much of the system a, as they could see and pointing out any, um, making any observations as far as uh, NESC compliance, looking at age and condition of facilities and um, how construction standards and processes that are employed by the utility, how they measure up to standard utility practice. General notes of the substation, these are some of the, uh, in general, the, most of the substations were in relatively good condition. They were uh, general maintenance issues that do need to be addressed and 
We, we have a long list and those are reflected in the back of the presentation. You'll see a long list of recommendations in the study. There were some detailed recommendations. I'll just mention a few of the, um, the more um, the um, situations that probably need to be addressed uh, immediately or at highest priority. And in most cases, it was condition of the fencing around the substations, uh, make sure that they meet the code as far as height, um, the barbed wiring around the top, um, and the grounding. It was noticed that a lot of the fence areas were not grounded, which could pose a uh, safety risk to the public and also to uh, your employees. Um, sub four especially had a lot of vegetation, trees overgrowing over on the fence, vegetation growing on the fence. Those are just typical things that, that do need to be addressed. Again, at sub four, uh, in the report, there are pictures in the back uh, that reflected some of these. Um, uh, John found that uh, neighbors on either side of the, or particularly on one side of the substation had piled cordwood up against the fence. Perfect. Well, you know, not a good situation for somebody to, you know, that's a stair Perfect. step up. <laughs> Of course, you also, uh, the uh, animals tend to like to hide in those wood piles and, you know, snakes can do uh, real damage when they crawl in and get in between the bushings of a substation transformer. Um, sub five, there were some erosion issues. A lot of these are really easy to take care of um, just with some, with some gravel, those, those type things, basically general maintenance. Um, and some of the bigger pieces of equipment, especially at substation four and substation five, there were concerns with overall age and condition of the uh, transformers and switch gear. Uh, age is not necessarily an overriding issue to replace a piece of equipment. Uh, in conjunction, I guess in, dur in conjunction with the time frame we were working on the plan, uh, Hamid had another group come in and do actual testing of the equipment. So, uh, and that was our recommendation to continue monitoring these older transformers. Um, we do have some other issues with the, uh, on the planning side of things that we'll address on substation four and five. But uh, in our recommendations, you will see a timely replacement <coughs> of these transformers and breakers. At least if the condition does not dictate transformers four and five right now to be replaced, monitor age, monitor condition, and in a long range, and we'll get more into the long range planning aspect later, at least when these transformers get into 40, 45, 50 year old range, we need at least uh, in our budget, long range budgets plan for those replacements. When we move into the, the distribution side of things, uh, one of the uh, deficiencies we found were the lack of a uh, specific construction standards. You know, a lot of the, the system is varying in ages. You know, you may have some um, areas that were constructed 60 plus years ago, 40 plus years ago, then some new construction. So you have a variety of pole top assemblies out there, those type things. Um, you have um, engineering staff based on our interviews had used manufacturer standards for their construction practices. Um, I think recently you have implemented national grid and APPA standards, but we're recommending that you put together a set of construction standards specific to RMLD. You have situations out in the field where you have multiple circuits, even up to five circuits on one pole line that a generic construction standard will not address. And so that Again, it goes back to the succession. You got your own standards that gives your designers specific standards to do new designs by, new upgrades by, and the subsequent people coming in, they've, they've got a standard to go by when they design and when they build these new facilities. Ken, you realize the town was founded in 1649, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty old. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with these design standards you know you not only have these construction standards but we're also trying to implement new design standards it seems in the past just based on our observations that a lot of construction has been been done by rule of thumb engineering 
it. This is the way we've always done it. Typically, if you are hanging this size wire, we use this size poles. Well, there was really no engineering calculations to back those up. Um, <coughs> so one of the recommendations was to implement a set of design procedures for proper pole sizing, proper guying standards, and equipment sizing, and again, the construction guidelines so that everybody is on the same page. We ensure with our designs that we're meeting the National Electric Safety Code standards. Um, one of the benefits of doing that, one, is being in compliance for one, and two, is limiting your liabilities. You know, accidents on poles that do not meet standards opens the utility up for liability. Another um, deficiency that was found that we would recommend was to take another look at your joint use agreement. A lot of this has been alluded to earlier in this meeting is that the current agreement was done in <coughs> January 1, 1980, and it does not address a lot of critical issues. Uh, first and foremost are having <coughs> minimum engineering construction and maintenance standards that are agreed upon between the two entities. I mean, you can do, you know, implementing our own design standards here, going out, designing a new line that meets your code, and then to have a third party such as Verizon come along and attach to that pole without proper notification, proper re-engineering of that pole to make sure that the calculations you painstakingly did to make sure that pole, that you're using the right size pole for strength requirements, that they do not come in and overload that pole and create a code violation, whether it be clearance or substandard poles and again, open you up to a liability. That's one thing that was missing from the current standard. Um, another thing is the inventory of attachments. You know, knowing where they're attached to your poles, knowing where you're attached to their poles. I'm not sure about the rental agreements, but there, you know, there is a value of each attachment and what those agreements are. Make sure you, un you understand that everybody's on the same page about the number of attachments and what the value of those that space on the pole is. Again, liability issues. And this is uh, a really big issue. One, when question, you, one question. When you say value, it's a financial value of the space on the pole? Is that what you mean? Right. In, in a lot of pole, in basically in the areas, most of the utilities we work with down south, the power company owns all the poles. And you have third parties coming in and attaching, and they pay rental space. Okay. for that space on the pole because you you know the utility has a sunk cost in putting in the extra height so that you get the clearance proper code clearance for those attachments and maybe even an extra class pole to give the proper strength to the line to support those attachments um, again liability issues you're attaching to poles that Verizon owns two-thirds of the poles that you're attached to has a Verizon on, or Verizon on, so that you want to make sure that their poles, you know, when you attach to that pole, that you're not creating some type of loading or reliability issue that, or clearance issue, so you would want to do the engineering even though you're attaching those poles and making sure, you know, in those minimum construction standards, that they, that they understand that you're going to build this pole, this pole line to NESC standards. Again, uh, part of that is notification of attachment. If, like I say, if you design that line, you want to know if they're coming along and attaching that pole and changing those conditions on that pole. Um, again, going back to the pole inspection program, there's a question about the current program only addressing the uh, RMLD on poles. Well, we're recommending that that program be negotiated and expanded into that area because again, that's two thirds of the poles, two-thirds of facilities that, that you're responsible for and you're being held potentially liable for. So there needs to be um, inspection processes, you know, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, at the current program in its second, beginning its second year now, you're seeing a 30% failure rate on the poles that, that you have control. Uh, based on, and William can correct me if I'm wrong, based on 
of their observations when they were up in that Wilmington area, the, typically the area that Verizon owns the poles, is that the poles appeared to be older in that area and of smaller class. So you can expect, you can likely expect that failure rate to probably continue or maybe even increase up in that particular area or finding some of the areas that do not meet minimum pole sizing standards um, will probably be more prevalent up in, in those areas. Uh, maintenance programs on the distribution assessment, again, we were looking at uh, transformers age and condition. Um, I think there's some, been some programs implemented recently on your operations and maintenance to actually come out on an annual basis or even a, a, a cyclical basis to actually perform tests on the transformers. These are your major pieces of equipment, major investment on your system that um, it's important to monitor those to make sure that they're not starting to gas or water form inside the oil inside the transformer, something that would lead to a, a, a failure of that unit. Um, pole inspection program, again, another recently uh, implemented program going for 10% of your poles, and uh, you know, as we previously discussed, that should be expanded. The grounding program, very important. Some of the observations that were made during just a routine field visit were, you know, just walking around the system, there are the copper pole bonds coming down to the ground rods, broken on some poles transformers seeing broken ground connections again the substation fencing missing or or grounding connections you know that is a that is a critical part of system operation from a safety issue because you can put all these nice relays breakers to deaden a line when a fault occurs but they count on a strong grounding program vegetation management you just recently went through a three-year cycle on your vegetation management uh, trees are the number one cause of outages on your system. Even with the, the covered cable, the Hendrix conductors up there, um, you're still heavily treed in this area. Um, the vegetation management, you know, Hendrix saves you from a lot of the momentary outages that would be caused from trees brushing into the line. But those trees that brush and rub on the line can degrade that outer insulator around that cable moisture gets inside that cable and that is the enemy of the life of that cable getting moisture underneath that uh that shield on the cable ken do you have any comments on the how uh, the grounds were broken i mean was it a stress kind of fracture was it lightning uh, uh, likely it you have long you have guys mowing lawns they bump into the pole you know you, it's typically a hard drawn copper sure you know about uh an eighth of an inch in diameter. It doesn't take a lot. Copper's a soft metal. It doesn't right. take a lot to do that. Um, so uh, typically you see it in, in that area. Um, some it may be just an old line buried into the ground, degradation, or somebody cuts into it, those, those type things. So uh, under just a routine inspections, you know, we encourage today when we met with, with the employees, when they're out, working on you know a two or three pole section of line is just to walk down and just check out the facilities two poles on one side two poles on the other side if they see these minor issues out there or maybe not so minor issues you know when you look at a pad mounted transformer if you see that metal casing rusting that a, a kid could come up and, and put a hand in or erosion around the pad write those things up immediately because those are safe public safety issues and liabilities and again on the pole of the transform the o and um, program to replace transformers those are the type of things you'll be attacking first it's not just age but you've got to also factor in loading and condition kind of that triple play you know it may be old but there may be a transformer that may be a lot younger but you start seeing those stains from oil leaks developing. So that, there's your two, age and condition. So uh, all these uh, O&M programs are important to, uh, to maintain system integrity and safety. One area we found uh, lacking, and this is one dear to my heart because I'm 
a system planning guy is uh, the lack of a long range system plan. Um, typically those expand the system out a 10 to 20 year period just to get, get a direction on where you want to take the system. And from those long range plans, you develop those short term capital improvement plans that are based in that long range philosophy. The critical component of establishing a planning uh, program is up front establishing your design criteria. How, how much do I want to load my substation transformers and feel comfortable about them? How much do I want to load my distribution circuits and feel comfortable? If I've got a radial feed, you know, typically leaving the substation and going out to the end uh, or the extremity of your service area, I may load that conductor on up to 80%. If I've got two circuits, <coughs> substation A, substation B, the circuits tie together, I want to keep that loading around 60% because if I lose this substation feed, I want to back feed it with the other substation. I want to make sure I've got capacity in there um, to make that happen at peak load conditions. So establishing that design criteria on system loading, delivery voltage, um, how you, just how you want to operate your system will give you the roadmap when you analyze your electric system on what type of improvements that I should be adding and what priority should I be adding those improvements. Uh, developing a system model, that is underway as we speak. Uh, that will be part of the GIS update and with the softwares that you have, you will be able to load your GIS information into your modeling software. You'll be able to load your customer information into your modeling software. So you will have a real-time as-built model with real-time loading and you can look at off-peak conditions, peak low conditions in summer, peak low conditions in winter, and uh, it will give you a real, real good feel of what uh, present system conditions, what, what voltages you would expect, you can run the simulations, what voltages you would expect to see at the end of the line. Compare that with your AMI system and what voltages you're actually reading at those points. Um, tracking system loading, all, all this is predicated upon having good data. So with the AMI, with the SCADA system upgrades, you'll be able to get substation transformer loading data, distribution circuit loading data, that you can do good projections, you know, based on a five, 10 year history, you can go out and do trending projections on in five years at current growth rates, what can I expect to see? Run those simulations in your model to have a longer range plan of, of what to do on your system. You know, a typical, um, long range planning scenario is, again, you go out and do your long range, what you expect to happen over the next 10 years. You come to a short term condition where I have to go out and rebuild a section of line. And typically, if you look, are short sighted, you may go bump it up one conductor size. In 10 years, you find out, well, mm, we're putting a substation here. That should be a much larger conductor to to feed that, so in 10 years, you're going back and rebuilding a line that still has 30 years of useful life or more left in it. Very inefficient. So uh, having a good long range plan and referring back to it when you do your capital improvement, your short term capital improvement plans can save you money in the long run. For the purpose of this study, uh, we took uh, some system one line diagrams and uh, Hamid's staff provided uh, loading uh, as far as connected transformers in those particular line sections. And we created a very basic model, in, basically in the same software that you will be using long term. To do, we conducted a voltage, capacity, and fault current analysis using that model. Again, it was very basic, only really focused on the main three phase lines. Um, and then we took those loads for each substation, each circuit where we had that circuit information available and tr uh, use growth rates, trending growth rates to look at a five, 10 year window, in some cases out to 20 years to check the loading, uh, projected loading on, on the system facilities. Uh, we also uh, 
used the fault current analysis. Uh, we'll get into the arc flash study later, but the fault current analysis was used to help produce that study, as well as look at, uh, do an overall review of the protective system coordination as it exists right now. Um, and then we also looked at, took a look at your system losses. Um, you know, basically the information we had in 2014, your losses were around 3.7%. For a utility this size, those numbers are in a good range. But as we all know, system losses is in the same vein as system reliability. It's kind of like your golf game. No matter how good you go out and play, you always think about those two or three extra strokes you left out on the course. So we're always striving to keep those loss numbers as low as possible as well as your reliability numbers. You want those numbers, those, those outage numbers, as low as possible. Again, on the system planning side, lack of the long range plan, substation transformer loading is one thing that we saw. In substation four, there are three transformers, A and C, are loaded over its base capacity rating right now with this last, last peak. Uh, you do have some upper rating, you start kicking in the fans, those 36 MVA transformers that we're showing as overloaded on the base can go up to 60 MVA. It typically, again, as part of this design criteria, typically you would use that delta between the 36 and 60 as your emergency capacity for load shifts. But, you know, that's something you, that as, a, as an engineering group would have to decide how comfortable we're we carrying what level of uh, transformer loading are we comfortable with? Uh, one major issue that we found were the um, substation getaways. Well, let me, let me drop back, substation contingency loading. We looked at an N minus one scenario for each of the substations. That is loss of one of the transformers. And could the other two, well, in the case of, of each station has, uh, I think has either three or two transformers. Could the remaining transformer with its maximum capacity ready, could it pick up all of the uh, remaining load? Let's say in the event of loss of one transformer. Sub four fails the N minus one contingency in year one. Um, sub uh, three fails in year six. And sub four and five, sometime between year six and year eight. So you know, catastrophic loss of a major, of one transformer, a rare occurrence, but you want to at least analyze those positions and know kind of where you sit as far as uh, what would happen in, in those cases. Uh, again, going back, the circuit getaway loading was one major issue that we saw. Um, each substation has underground duct bank circuits come out for varying lengths in those concrete encased ducts. Um, in, in each case, you have to derate the conductor if for a circuit duct bank. If it's direct buried, you use 100% of capacity. We went to manufacturer's tables uh, to create a, to see uh, where we, um, how much to derate those. And we found out that nine of your circuits eight or nine of the circuits are currently loaded above 100% of that derated capacity, and 18 of the circuits are loaded above 60% of the derated capacity. So in the event of a load shift, um, there are some overloading conditions out there at peak, and that, that could be a contributing factor to some of the reliability issues you've had in that underground duct with splices failing and um, elbows failing, just the heat, the heat buildup there. Uh, one of the major projects that were recommended, and um, it was discussed in our first meeting here through our interviews, both with operations and engineering personnel, was uh, identifying the load center up in the Wilmington area. A lot, a large portion of, of this utility's load is centered in that area, and there's a, there's a large high density load center sitting out there it's adjacent to a transmission line. So um, we're recommending in years three through five, it's gonna be a multi-year process to construct that station, is to uh, build the proposed Wilmington substation in that area. And one, going back again to the system planning aspect of things, 
we saw loading conditions on sub four and five. Well, those two substations serve that area. So if we are shifting load away from those into this new, it relieves those loading conditions on the substation transformers as well as some of the circuits that feed up into that area. Uh, one of the questions that was posed to us in the RFP was, are we spending enough on O&M? What should we be spending on O&M? And, um, you know, that's kind of an open-ended question there. Typically, you look at life of facilities. You have manufacturers that will give you typical life of any particular type of equipment you're putting out there. Uh, if you look at depreciation schedules, you'll see a, roughly a 33, 30, 33 year depreciation life on some of these facilities. We're just using just a blend. We know there are facilities out there that'll last longer. So using a say a 40 year window, if you look logically in that window, if the life of the facilities are 40 years, you're looking at basically rebuilding your system through either operations and maintenance or system improvements every 40 years. So with that process, you should be spending at least 2.5% of your net plant value on either system upgrades or operation and maintenance projects just to keep pace with the uh, lo loss of life of these facilities. Um, from our observations, again, looking at that median 20 years of age, that median level, the 40 year window we're talking about, we estimate that that blended average life or age of your system facilities are in excess of that 20 year period. So you may need to be accelerating ahead of that 2.5 percent pace. Hey, Could I so, ask a question? Yes. You mind please. if I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, there's some quite extensive uh, uh, programs that uh, Hamid and Colleen have outlined to us uh, that look pretty impressive to us. Do you feel that what, what, what's been sketched out is, is covering uh, a lot of this? These implemented programs, we went through all of those. The pole inspection program, 10 percent is a utility standard. So they're, so they're doing year. this? Yes, these programs are well within all utilities we work with that we recommend these type programs. But we're doing it already. Yeah, they are already implemented. All right, good. So so a lot of these things have, have are in the process or have been implemented. That's my that's my impression is that we're that Colleen's on top of this stuff. Yeah. And and I'm just wondering what we what we pull out of this that we need to know that isn't already being implemented. Okay. That's, what I was, that's just what I'm just trying to get to the, you know, the executive summary from here of what this board needs to know um, that isn't already being done, just so we could just, just to move it, move it along a little bit, I guess. Okay, well, the expansion yeah. of, the, of the grounding program, uh, use, use of lightning arresters, making sure that when you drive grounds, they're properly driven and measured. Um, the uh, implementation of a detailed co system coordination study uh, once this new model is developed, uh, that you get better fault currents, you get the entire system covered. Um, expansion of use of protective devices downline rather than just right. your substation relays and breakers and then a few fuses out is the application of reclosers down the line and the coordination of those facilities. Okay, so yeah, we've had discussions all along this, this right. process and but we I just want to confirm that the, the programs that have been implemented are industry standard. Right. Yeah, I, yeah so I think well, if I understand Dave's question, it's, there's value because this came up, I think, at the CAB meeting uh, um, when I was attending in the CAPEX review. So, you know, a chunk of it is validation, right? So. Uh, you're looking for an independent party, in this case your company, to come in and confirm that we're doing the right things because if we're not, we're gonna, the gap's going to get bigger. So that, that in itself is very important. So I, I guess, and I don't know if you can put a percent on it, Ken, but is it so um, like we saw on the organizational report, there's, you know, you could think about the areas that we really need to target going forward. Would you say it's seventy percent are you know steady course do the things you've been doing, and there's another thirty percent of 
you know, maybe accelerated programs or even new ideas? Is it sort of is that oversimplistic or? Um, I think in a lot of cases, as you implement these design standards, you know, one thing has been the pole guying, pole yep. sizing. And in conjunction with the pole inspection program, you're going to be going out and replacing a lot of poles. Right. So that you're going to have a, a, um, a great opportunity to go in and apply these new standards to a, a lot of your system at that point. So, um, so a lot of it is sort of standardizing uh, the process as opposed to being reactive and doing something when it breaks or right. You, yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's a, that's a big part of things is moving into that reactive. The good news is when we did that long range analysis, we didn't see a lot of major line loading issues out there that you have to go out and do wholesale replacement just due to capacity of line. That in most cases it's going to be going out and taking care of these code violations, making sure you got proper design standards and the engineering backup to uh, to justify those. Yeah, but take care of your Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I guess what I'm just trying to get through some of the detail and understand, abstract it out to what the board needs to know, um, you know, because I, I, I think we all know that we have some good engineers running the ship. So um, I guess I'm just looking for the more of the abstracted out one one level higher of what we need to know at this point. Okay. Well, Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 yeah I think so it's kind of the executive summary. A little bit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, something, but yeah. So. Anyway, one thing we want to hit on is, you know, the KD and safety numbers, your reliability numbers are, are, are pretty good. They're below the uh, regional and national averages, again, comparing those. With the age and condition, one concern is the degradation of reliability will happen on an exponential curve with the age and condition. Being get, using the proactive o &M program to get on a systematic replacement will, will save the surprises down the road in large capital expenditures. Uh, on the safety side, one major deficiency that was a concern was a lack of a formal arc flash program. In talking to um, some of the operations people, they do have the, the PPE equipment, the per, uh, personal protective equipment, um, but we, in the interim we have completed the arc flash analysis. I'll be coming up next week to, to go over that with the engineering and operations people um, and uh, the implementation implementation of regularly scheduled safety meetings. Uh, the organization, I will not go over that too much. Uh, I think uh, Lido's took the lead on that. We did supply uh, some uh, assistance in the uh, technical, the engineering end of things. Uh, you know, with these new requirements for engineering design, there will be expanded job responsibilities. Uh, training will be needed. And the ultimate goals are keep most of the engineering duties in-house, provide that career path, a merit-based career path, getting a minimum of five engineers up to a system engineering level, meaning that they can, they're capable of doing any engineering task ask of them in, in electric system design and operating and implementing your maintenance programs with those project, project management skills uh, but we want each of the engineers to have a specialized skill. Everybody's not going to be great at one thing, but have those specialized skills with a backup specialization so that all these knowledge bases aren't compartmentalized, that if you would happen to lose one person to retirement or, or any other condition, that you would have a backup for that knowledge base. And also establish an on-call rotation between the engineers during uh, uh, contingency and outage conditions. Uh, grid modernization, that is a mandated plan by the Massachusetts DPU, and I don't know if, if you've read that order, but uh, it requires you have a plan implemented over 10 years. You do have that plan in place, um, and you're starting to stage in some of that implementation now. The GIS system, RFPs are out for upgrade, AMI upgrades in progress, uh, your CIS, and windmill, that distribution analysis software and integration between those are also in progress. And again, some of the major other focus of the, uh, the, this mandated plan is the uh, 
SCADA upgrades, those things are in this long range plan that uh, the recommendations that are provided in. I'll just touch on one quick issue. We've talked about distributed generation. That is a large component of the uh, DPU plan uh, for peak load uh, shedding. Uh, with those credits, uh, you, you've saw, you've, you've seen the presentation on that. So, uh, you know, that is a major mandated component in the plan. Um, we, again, we've also touched on this, the uh, fiber loop, that primary function of it is to provide RMLD with their own communications and data transfer um, requirement. And there will be a natural expansion through the grid modernization program. Um, RMLD is currently leasing dark fiber and you know there are avenues of expanding the use of this fiber loop and just you know the fiber telecommun telecommunications is not our bailiwick you know we are uh, a utility uh, electrical utility engineering company but we just recommend that a comprehensive realistic <coughs> study of business plan be developed before branching outside of these core business issues. Again, summary, system deficiency, the major system deficiency we found were the lack of an arc flash study, uh, a lack of construction and design standards, and part of that has been taken care of today uh, or this week with the, uh, the training that has been done. Uh, lack of for a formal system planning program, uh, the current GIS is not suitable, that's why you went out for the, uh, the RFP to upgrade the data collection on your GIS system. Um, we've documented the maintenance programs and the uh, requirements for a pole attachment agreement. Again, these recommendations, I won't go through each and every one. We've talked about a lot of the recommendations tonight. They are prioritized by year or a block of years. I mean, we realize when we do these, we flag these, these issues and <coughs> recommend corrections for these issues. So um, necessarily we have to put them in some type of a timeline time and priority. Um, highest priority first, of course, um, and um, but we also recognize that an electric system is a dynamic system. System conditions change every year as you go to these long-range plans, reevaluate the projects. If load does not develop, push the projects back. You know, it is a dynamic plan, and your short-term capital plan should should reflect that. They reflect those changing system conditions. So, any additional questions? One question. Yes. yes. I'm majoring in accounting. What is an arc flash? <laughs> what is that? Arc flash. I'm not an engineer. I'm an accountant. <laughs> it is a, a short arc. circuit condition where um, two conductors, you know, current wants to continue on a path, and when you break that path, it still wants to follow that path. So there is, it draws, you know, when you open up a switch on the system, it draws an arc. And with that arc comes heat, pressure, combustion, that can uh, cause significant damage. And the arc flash study calculates the potential of those, of that energy at different points on the system. It's relative to your uh, location to the blast, the magnitude of the blast, how quick your uh, protective devices will open. Um, and so we did the study on the system uh, for critical points on it to make sure that when your employees are working within those particular zones, that they have the proper protective equipment on. And that it meets, it's, a, it's an NESC requirement that these studies be done, that the proper PPE is required. It's also OSHA requirements because they're in on the action now and they act as the policing agent that these studies are done, implemented, and your personnel are properly trained.
Yeah, that's one area of mitigation. The other is instead of going, we did calculations at 15 inches that simulate gloving. We did calculations at 48 inches away that simulate using a, a short stick and then at 72 inches to simulate a long stick. So you can also uh, modify your work processes that rather than being in and gloving, if you can use the hot stick, the arc flash incident, incident energy diminishes greatly as you move away from that potential arc. What I like about your report is it's clear that you work together with Hamid to incorporate many of your recommendations into the capital budget already, so that's that's great. I mean, I th almost 50%. Yeah, uh, yes, I, th I think so, as, as opposed to many consultants who wait to the end <laughs> to give you the news, <laughs> right? So that's great. Well, it is a, it is a, a, a complementary process, and in, in most cases there are uh, multiple ways to achieve the same goal. It's just a matter of how different utilities operate. Same thing with establishing the design criteria and planning. You know, there's more than one way to solve this problem. It just does it fit in your operating philosophy. Good. Any other? Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. No, good. Thank thanks. Uh, as with the prior study and report, very comprehensive. And uh, as I said, you know, part of the dilemma, uh, some of uh, human nature is when there's, you know, a lot of good things, it feels like the report was unnecessary. And of course, that isn't the case. But you just have to look at it from it's a validation of, and I'm sure you run into that with your All work. You know, so. Well, some of the board employees say, I can use it. But that's kind of the good news, bad news scenario. The good news is there's no crisis to drive this, but the bad news is there's a lot of aging infrastructure that at some point you don't want to let it get to that critical no. mass where a major ice storm or major storm can bring down right. a lot of the, the infrastructure in yeah. one yeah. shot. And large unexpected things. And this kind of study has not been done before, if I understand correctly. What you did has not really been done around here at all. So nothing done formally like this. I think there may have been some, some in-house at some point, but nothing formal like well, that's this. That's great. No, Thank you. The, the Arc Flash study was actually by law required in 2009. So we're a little late, but it's done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, we're within the six-year mandated window. <laughs> <laughs> so you have lots of challenges in Grace general, period. and the Great. maintenance, and you know, yep. aging infrastructure that needs to be upgraded and to be done and to be maintained. But you guys are going to have to take that in now, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, when Amid presented it at the CAB meeting on the CAPEX budget, it, it's really, you know, going from reactive to proactive, and that's the that's the value. It's just a matter of just using simple round numbers, 10,000 a year, 10,000 a year, 10,000 a year for 10 years, the 100,000 in one year. If you can add to control the expenditures a little bit better on, on a systematic basis. Sure. And, and again, proactive to get ahead of the game. Good. Well, thank you, and thanks to all the thank staff you. and most groups. We appreciate all the, the work that was done. We'll certainly take advantage of it. Okay, uh, next agenda item. Uh, Phil, you have a committee report? Yeah, I got a couple. Are, are you going to let me report on the audit committee too? I mean, I'm going to insist on it. Yes, okay, okay. thank you. I'll just take the policy committee. You want to know everything that was said at the meeting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. We may hit the curfew in that case. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we would get it. That's right. Uh, <coughs> um, I think in the package you've got the, uh, the surplus material uh, policy. Uh, two with the revision and then the procurement policy uh, and I, at our last meeting we actually voted to recommend the board adopt both of these we did make uh, a few changes um, but uh, we did recommend to that the board uh, adopt this in terms of the policy committee and it was uh, three zero was the vote <coughs> so we want to yeah I mean I'll move motion. that the uh, you want to do both? Uh, you want to do them separately, or you want to do all both as, uh, together, as one motion? Yeah, you can do them together. Do them together. Yeah. Okay, I'll recommend that the, I I move that the board adopt the RMLD policy material policy two revision five, and the RMLD's uh, procurement policy nine revision four. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Five zero zero. Right. In terms of the fiber optic up update. Um, 
former chairman now, yes. <laughs> yeah. Talbot was there, and uh, basically we talked about the, the fiber optic network, <coughs> and uh, what we decided is we really should get a presentation as to what exactly, you know, is being done with the fiber optic, and who's on what, and who's on first base, and all that for uh, seeing the agenda with coming on May, uh, the next meeting at the next meeting. So if you have an update, because I, I didn't feel I was really up to speed totally on that, so yeah. we'll get a presentation. All right, the audit committee, I'll just uh, state a couple of quick, uh, quick things. The audit committee met last night. This is the town of Reading audit committee. Right. And this was, they met on the uh, fiscal year, June 30, 2014. And basically the audit, and I have some copies of the, the minutes and who's audited, anybody would like to see them. <coughs> um, basically they break the, the audit down into two categories. They talk one about the uh, general fund, which is kind of the operations of the town. And we talked about the priority priority type funds, which is the, the light department, the water department, um, and there's another one in there too. But uh, there's a third one, I can't remember what it is. But they talked about those. Um, there really was nothing that came out of this that was a discussion about the RMLD at this point. You know, there were no concerns that were raised. Uh, one of the things that they did raise is, and it was an issue that was raised at town meeting, is on the reserve and the uh, revolving funds. The auditors believe that not all costs are being allocated properly against some of the revolving fund, and they've recommended that the town look into that. Uh, the topic came up among the school committee, um, and the school is believed that um, some of the reserve funds have a anywhere from 12 to 24 months worth of revenue in them going forward. And that's potentially that the, some of the reserve funds, some of the revolving funds in the town may be overfunded. Basically, the committee um, at this point uh, made a recommendation, uh, and I understand the school committee, the new uh, business management school committee, and the town accountant are trying are work now working out this, this particular issue. But the um, in terms of what the recommendation for the audit committee was, is that the audit committee recommended that the finance committee look into this situation and follow up on it. The town of Reading finance committee follow up on that at this okay. point. Um, in terms of, it was a quick update the, from the chairman of the audit committee, who's also the chairman of the finance committee. And basically, in terms of the procurement, he said phase one is complete, done, and everything has been taken care of. And that was the investigation of the, the trucks. Uh, there is a phase two now going on where questionnaires have been sent out to all the town departments asking about the procurement uh, procedures, and they're looking to get those questionnaires back at this point. And decide where they want to go from there at this at that point. So. We have sent ours back. Okay. Yes. <laughs> there are actually, I believe, three departments that have not in the town yet. So. Okay. Excellent. And the, basically, they accepted the uh, the committee voted to uh, accept the audit and the management letter. I have copies of the management letter here, specifically addressing the reserve fund issue, the revolving funds issue. And then we also voted to authorize the audit for this year. We approved the. The, we recommended that the uh, chairman sign the engagement letter. So Good. that's a quick update. Great. Thank you, Phil. Okay, I think we're on item 10, uh, general manager's report. Yeah, first I'd like to see if we, if I could suggest that we defer our um, power supply report, engineering operations report, and financial report to the next meeting. That's fine. That's okay with I me. Think sure. Any uh, objections? No. Okay. We may be snoozing during it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, as far as the surplus property, um, based on the policy, I don't really have anything in the substantial uh, category to report. Um, but you know, just for human interest, I'll throw out there that in the March auction of the JJ Kane out in Worcester, we did sell the trucks at uh, seven thousand, seven thousand, and nine thousand. Uh, that takes into consideration the commissions and the appraisals. Seven, seven, and nine. Approximately seven seven nine. When you take off the commissions and the appraisals, monies that were spent. Right. Um, it's also the factor too that the trucks. You got to remember that during the snowstorm too, when bucket trucks were in demand. Right. right. True. True. Yep. The roof cleaned. Yeah. Sure. So. Ouch. Yeah. yeah. And that helps the roofing business. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> they dig too deep. 
Okay. Um, anything else, Colleen? Uh, just for the 2015 uh, NEPA annual conference on August 23rd to 26th, um, I'd like your permission to attend that. Any objections? Okay. I've, nope. already, I've already signed okay. up. Okay. I've already booked the hotel. Okay. <coughs> uh, okay, so we need a motion. Move. Yeah, I'll move that we authorize the uh, general manager to attend the NEPA conference uh, on, on August 13th to August 26th, 2015. What, it, what is the conference? Well, it's, what does it stand for, NEPA? Northeast Public Power Association. It's kind of the regional group that oversees New England. And I believe they have, they also part of Upper State New York, too. So in that organization. Good thing to attend. Yeah. It's like a yeah, training. Of course, yeah. It's like a training. I just didn't know what it, no, I didn't know what it was. Sure. Yeah. Well, we're sure. Was, uh, <laughs> right. That's right. Yes. Okay, thank you. And when do you need to know for reservation purposes? Then? What's a safe date to let you know? Well, same as the hotel. Yeah, so soon. Yep. Was that a motion we need a second on? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, second. Okay, all in favor? Okay, five zero zero. thank yeah, you. If you go to the, the NEPA website, they have a connection right to the hotel. You can book the hotel. Because they have a special, they have a rate, a special NEPA rate on there, which is what I did. And I suggest you don't wait because you know if you may get shut out, you may end up a different hotel. <laughs> Is that bad advice? Well, well it's the Mount Washington Hotel, so you want to be in there. Yes. Oh. You don't, don't want to be at the Motel Six down the road. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all agree with that. Yes. Okay. Uh, do we also do we have a motion for a Digger Derrick award? Um, I move that uh, bid 2015-24 for one. Hold on, John. We're gonna. Oh. Side here. Second. Second. Okay, so Colleen, is there something, anything else for you? Number 14. Yeah, I yep. think jo um, John's going to. IFB 2015 24 for one digger Derek with a trade in. Um, just so you let you know, the we traded in a, um, a digger truck. We got $3,500 for that. Okay. Okay, John, you want to yep. give us a motion? Sure. Um, I move that uh, bid. 2015-24 for one digger Derek be awarded to James A. Kiley Company for $253,550 as the lowest qualified and responsive bidder on the recommendation of the general manager. Second. Okay. okay. All in favor? Okay. Five zero zero. Approved. Okay. Uh, Gene, anything we need to discuss under the. Uh, To me, feel with my phone. It's already on my calendar. You must have told us about it. Yeah. Okay, I know I'm comfy. Okay. I think I'm okay. I know I'm not away. So what's the? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just taking a look. I'm pretty sure it's probably fine. It's uh, June 25th. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fine. Anything else, Gene, on the schedule? Okay. Uh, we'll move that the board go into executive session. Oh, we're move not going to. Adjourn, to. Okay. okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Five zero zero. Meeting adjourned. Good.